I got you. Oh, hamstring. Oh, <laughs> sniper, take the other picture. Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how you can formulate opinions without having true facts. I'm telling you, think about it logically for just a second. Dear Reds fans, Welcome back to the Zebra Zillionaires. It was a tough one yesterday. Live from Chatterbox Sports Studios, it's Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman. Well, good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good Wednesday morning. We are working with a skeleton crew here today. We welcome you to Off the Bench, presented by United Dairy Farmers. Before we go any further... Spinning the dials over there today, Reed Mouse, Trace, good morning, fellas. No Casey today. A little under the weather for the old boy, so we wish him well. We're thinking about him. Are you okay over there? Uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, Tom. I mean, I said to you this morning that you are truly our jack of all trades here he at Chatterbox. Without, I mean, whether it's setting up the, the video board, traveling to – you know, some event in Toledo or Michigan or Iowa or, or Hamilton or wherever. You're on it. Last weekend, two weekends ago, we were down at Paycor. There you were. Had the whole thing set up, up and running. Like, you know, Trump building a, a skyscraper in New York City. You had it going on. Me and Donald Trump have a lot in you common. Do. You do. Have a lot in common. <laughs> yeah. You're married to blondes, or you were married to blondes. That's, that's in this right. case, he used to be. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Um... <laughs> Anyway, it's great to have you with us. Zebra, are you okay today? I'm doing great. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to, listen, I'm just trying to be a, a, calming, a calming presence over here. I, I, I know Why, Reed, do you sense some kind of like... Well, no, I just, I, I, it's important for Reed to know that I'm here for him. I'm over here, and I'm going to be his <laughs> calming presence. And, what, and, what are you able to do for him sitting well, over there exactly? Well, here's what will happen, Tom. If there's ever a moment in the show where Reed feels stressful or, or it's, he's being overwhelmed, I will go over there and I will give him a hug. I will embrace him. You know what? So I think that is his, that's the best I can do. You got to love one another. Yeah, that's right? it. That's right. I mean, we were talking about Jesuits and Catholics and Franciscans and we were talking <laughs> to Dominicans and we were talking about all kinds of things this morning. I mean, we talk about more than just sports around here. And so, you know, we got to love one another. That's what we're all about around here. Uh, you can find us. We come your way Monday through Friday, 10 a. to 12 p. Mm. And you can find us on YouTube, Chatterbox Sports. We're on Twitter, broadcasting live, or maybe not today. We are. We are, okay, at Seabox Sports. If you'd rather join us in podcast form, by all means, just search Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman, and you're dialed in. Look, we'll get to the day in sports a little bit later on. But, I mean, a very busy man. Is my dad the Hall of Famer, Marty Brenneman? Uh, he's ready to go. We coordinated the gray zip ups. What do they call them? Half zips. Is that the terminology? You being the fashion guy that you are. That's it. Uh oh. That's exactly what they're called. <clears throat> Excuse me. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So is that what it's called? A half zip. A half zip pullover. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got well, a lot of them too. I know you do. You have hundreds of them, I think, in every well, color that, known to man. I do, and I'm always on the lookout for more. Okay. Well, we'll keep, an eye, we'll, we'll keep that in mind for Christmas. Maybe your uh, grand, Thank you very your grandkids much. Can, can keep that in mind. That's uh, correct. <laughs> let, me, let me get to, to something uh, right from the get-go, and that was Reds Fest. You were there over the weekend. What yes. was your impression of the event? Because let's face it, I, I, I got to believe I wasn't there, but I got to believe it had to be the difference between night and day this year compared to this time a year ago, right? Well, I, you know what? I, I don't know that they had the attendance that they had anticipated having uh, because I think the, the, the year-to-year uh, attendance is pretty much dictated by the kind of year that your team had the summer before. And we all know what an exciting year this ball club had in 2023 – um, I think they ended up, and not if it was less, it was minimal. I think they ended up somewhere in the neighborhood of 17,000 people for the two days. And and um, it was, I don't know that, they, you know, I know the Chicago Cubs probably are credited with the team that started this. I don't know how many other clubs do this, but I think the Cubs had been doing it for a lot of years, even when the Reds began. I can't believe that anybody, 
including the Cubs, do a better job than the Reds do. Yeah. I mean, with yeah. all the things that they have to interest fans, uh, you know, the obligatory line lines for autographs or for photos, everybody does that. But all the other things that they do uh, just makes it an incredible two-day affair. And, and this year was no different. They had a great number of people that, uh, of course, played in the poker tournament, uh, which is named in honor of uh, one of the best friends I've ever had in the world and Rick Steiner. Um, it, it, I thought it was a very good event. I truly did. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's going to be an event that will take a hiatus now of probably two years because um, they can't go back to the convention center next January because they're going to do a major renovation down there. And there really is no other building in this area that will accommodate them in terms of the number of people that they attract, even if the crowd's not as good as they think it will be. So they're not going to, I don't think they're going to do one in January of next year. I don't think uh, the Reds Fest will be back until probably January of 2025. Wow. I didn't know that. I knew they were doing the work on the convention center. I just assumed that they would find, you know, a hotel. Uh, it may not be the same space, obviously, but I mean, you mentioned that's the right. thing. Now that's it at one of the largest hotels. I got to believe on the planet uh, that they have it. Uh, it used to be the Hilton. I don't know if it is anymore in downtown Chicago when they have that thing. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, you're right. It's mayhem. And, and I'm glad to hear it went well over the weekend. Was there anybody there? Cause you're busy. People are kind of in and out for people that don't know how it kind of works for a guy like you or when I was doing it. You know, we were given specific times, you know, like on Friday, three to four, do this, five to six, do this, six to seven, do that. And then you're done. Then you come back the next day and it's a whole line of things you have to do. So you don't get a ton of time, although you might have a little time for socializing and seeing some old friends and some former Reds and things like that. Was there anybody, just out of curiosity, that you talked to that you hadn't seen in a while, that, that maybe you met for the first time, that, that, that you found interesting over the weekend at Reds Fest? Well, I, you know, uh, in my cat, I'm just speaking for me personally. Uh, I had to be down there <clears throat> on um, Friday afternoon. My first deal was 3 o'clock. And on Saturday, it was 11 a.m. I get down there early both days in order to go to what they call the green room, yep. which is on the second floor where all the players and broadcasters and everybody else involved in it uh, gather. And they have uh, they have food up there. Um, it, it's just a, a major, you know, a, a big screen TV with couches uh, that guys can hang out in between appearances. But I go early just to see fellas that maybe I've not seen in a while or guys that I really want to see on a year to year basis. And I saw, you know, I saw all the usual guys, but every year there seems to be one person who shows up and, and you don't know he's coming. Uh, and, and in my, excuse me, in my case, it was Skeeter Barnes. Yeah. Who I thought the world of when he played in Cincinnati uh, and, and he was there for the first time. In fact, when I saw him, I didn't recognize him. He's got a, a beard and he looks very, he looks like a college professor. He's so dignified looking. And then after I looked at him for a few minutes, when he was away from me and I was chatting with somebody else, I thought, that's Skeeter Barnes. So I went over to him and he said he laughed and we hugged and he said, I didn't think you'd recognize me. I said, yeah, but after a while I did. Skeeter Barnes was a highlight for me, but it's always a highlight, always. And I underlined that word in caps, Lenny Harris. No doubt. No doubt about it. I, and both of you, I'm, both of them, I might add, one of the first questions was how you were doing, Skeeter included. Of course, you and Lenny have such a great relationship over the years. And, and I just, there isn't anybody that I think any more highly of as a person, uh, as a guy that was incredibly uh, uh, influential with young players when he was on this ball club here. And I, they're just two of my favorite people. And, and it, it, it made the weekend for me uh, to see them. And now I'm really looking forward to going to uh, the fantasy camp, which I'll be doing for the third or fourth year in a row, <clears throat> January 15th through the 22nd, because Lenny will be out there. And I'll, I spend a lot of time with Lenny when I'm out there. Uh, he just, he's the kind of guy that people gravitate toward. Oh, yeah. You know how funny he is. Oh, man. And, uh, and it's just unreal. I mean, I, I just, I can't get enough of Lenny Harris and, 
and and it it, it does it does my old heart good to see guys that I felt so highly of uh, when they were playing. And, and and get a chance to renew old acquaintances with them. And, but they were the two big highlights. And, of course, you know, the other people that I dearly love, Doug, I mean, Tommy, Tommy Hume and, and, uh, and people like that, uh, it, it's really almost like it's a reunion is what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the older guys, I think it's even more so because we've been away from this young crop of players, and I know very few players on this club. Um, but to see these older guys, it really makes it worthwhile for me. You know, I was a little surprised, and maybe I shouldn't be. I guess the more I thought about it, I, I said I probably shouldn't be surprised, considering the situation that we're in right now. Um, but I thought maybe, just maybe, and I don't know if you heard anybody talk about this or talk to anyone about this. I thought, uh, I was kind of hoping Votto was going to be there. Uh, if for no other reason, I know he took the thing out on social media. He did the message, which he did a beautiful job on X. Uh, and all that kind of thing, which which most Reds fans have seen. Uh, uh, clearly, he's a free agent. And so, you know, the whole dynamics uh, would probably be a little weird for everybody. But but because the fans really never got a chance to say goodbye, because, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen with him and his contract status, hopefully, at least maybe next year, even if he's playing somewhere else, even still an active player, it would be kind of cool to have him come back. Yeah, I, I don't. Dis- I, I disagree with you on having him there. I yeah. think that would have created a very uncomfortable yeah, situation. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, so I, that did not bother me at all. I understood that and and anticipated that from the get go. But I agree with what you say. I think there will come a time, um, whether it's next year or whether it's the season after he retires, that they will make a big deal out of it, which they absolutely should. And I think they know that. Uh, I think he anticipates that. I don't know how much he really wants that. but And, and I'm saying that uh, given his personality and, and has never seemed to me to be one that wants a lot of praise heaped upon him. Um, but I think down the road that will happen. And, you know, if, if, in fact, he signs with Toronto, and all we're doing is speculation now because that's all it is, um, they would have a chance to do something next year. I'm, I'm not, I don't know what, whether Toronto's coming here or not. Um, I don't know how the schedule plays out, but I, I'm sure down the road there will be something monumental done for him to honor the career he had here in Cincinnati. All right, let's talk about the current red legs. Um, hey, look, you know, Nick Crawl did not mince any words at all. Uh, I, I always admire his honesty. I think he's a straight-up dude. It doesn't mean he has to tell you everything that's going on. But when he was asked specifically about Jonathan India, he said, look, we've already talked to this guy about the possibility of, of playing different positions. We want him back. We're not actively trying to trade him, which has seemingly been a nonstop story going back to the middle of last summer, even around the trade deadline. Uh, And he said, look, you know, if we've got to move steer to the outfield full time, sprinkle in India here and there, these different positions, whatever it might be. Uh, He said, now, I'm not saying I won't trade him. And he said he told India that. But, but I, I thought it was really good for Crawl for the first time to get ahead of this thing because it seems like it's never ending. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think they have to <clears throat> come to a a final determination about what they're going to do with him. I think I think it would be very uncomfortable for him to come to spring training, and this club is still uh, in the market to trade him. Um, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. You know, his defensive numbers were terrible last season. I think it's a foregone conclusion unless something cataclysmic occurs that he's not going to play second base on a regular basis. Um, I don't know. I, 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 and I know what the, what the pluses are with this young man. I told somebody the other day, for as young as he is, he has a higher level of leadership for his age of any player I think I've ever been around. I've never known a young guy like him, 26, 25, 26, 27, whatever he is to have as much influence over guys that, one, are younger than he is, or two, guys that may be equal to or older than he is. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a foregone conclusion that he and and, uh, Votto were the two leaders in that clubhouse last season. That counts for something. I don't know how much it counts for, 
And I certainly don't think that any club is going to keep a player simply because of his ability to lead in the clubhouse. Uh, because at the end of the day, let's face it, this is a business, and the business is all about winning. Um, I, but I think that they you know, they owe it to themselves. They owe it to him. Uh, because I don't think you can go to spring training. This club's got a lot of talent. I don't know you can go to spring training and have three or four or five different positions open. I mean, you have to have some degree of of, of being able to determine if we open the season today – here's the people that are definitely going to play and where they're going to play. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they figure that the 30 games that they play in spring training will determine where people will play when the season opens next late March. But in, in, in India's case, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out with him, uh, whether he's here, whether he's somewhere else. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, um, you know, I got to thinking when I saw the, the Bally story uh, about how this looks like it's going to be the final year. The Reds, uh, if you believe the dollar amount, uh, are getting $60 million a year for their local television rights. Uh, and that Bally's is going to pull the plug on all of it. Not just the Reds, but everybody. They kind of started in that direction. They not kind of started. They did start in that direction last year when they dumped the Diamondbacks uh, and the Padres. They dumped Minnesota at the end of the year. There's talk about the Reds and Cleveland being done at the end of the year. That's pretty much a certainty. In fact, they could pull the plug at any time, is my understanding. I mean, they could do it Correct. right before this season starts. So, uh, but, but, but Major League Baseball last year with the Diamondbacks and with San Diego, they basically paid them 80% of what they were supposed to get. Okay, this is a very long-winded yes. way of getting to my next point. Nobody can make me believe, and I know that Karen Forgas, who does a great job as a senior vice president, right-hand person of Bob Castellini, she stood up over Reds Fest, addressed this with the press, said it's business as usual, nothing's going to change with what we want to do with this team or affect our payroll in 2024. Okay, fine. But if you're going out there to make moves, and let's just pick random pick, let, let, let's say – uh, Dylan Cease, he's been in, you know, a, a hot name, right, from the White Sox. And the whole they could trade some prospects to bring him in here and be their number one guy, theoretically. You'd have him under control for the next couple of years, but that, that's going to be some money because he's had pretty good success, runner-up in the Cy Young two years ago. But, you know, whether it's signing a free agent, there's talk about Candelario and some of these guys. Um, I find it hard to believe that. You know, I'm sitting there saying to myself going – Knowing that I'm minus 60 million and knowing that the Minnesota Twins are sitting here right now, the first week of December, and they do not have any idea where they're putting their games on television this year. They have no clue where they're putting them. I just read this extensive article about them already. Now, the Reds would have a year to get ready for all of that. But what I'm in a long-winded way of getting to and asking you is... It's really long-winded, too. It is. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I'm just, I'm just giving background for some people who don't know this whole thing. You, the way you it ask works. longer questions than Bill Cunningham does. Well, Go no, ahead. not quite. Not quite. Because <laughs> I'm trying to pattern myself to not do that, but I am doing it now. Thank you, though, for reminding me. I mean, doesn't yeah. it have to affect the way you do business today? I don't think it affects the way they do business right now for 2024. I truly, uh, I truly do not believe that. And that might be a naive statement on my part, but I don't think this club looking toward the coming season, looking back at the productivity that they got from their people last year and how many of those people are under contract control for a number of years to come. I don't think this ownership, this baseball operation can afford to hold back money because they don't know what their TV situation is going to be beginning in 2025. I don't think you can lose the magic and the interest uh, that you built last summer over an unexpectedly wonderful year for this ball club. I just don't think you can do it. Um, now, as you mentioned, and I don't think that uh, I think that Bally has a payment to make to the Reds and maybe to Cleveland and whoever else in uh, next month in January. If they miss that payment, they don't make that payment. My understanding is that automatically 
they can lose the rights instantaneously. Yep. And and obviously, if they miss a payment in January, I think it's pretty much indicative of the probability that they don't have the money. So now now you've got a real problem. But I don't think, given what we know today, that this team can withhold money and not make a trade or not sign a player because they're looking toward 2025 when there is indecision about where their games are going to be as far as TV is concerned. I really, truly don't believe that. Do you think when all is said and done, the Reds should give up some prospects? And I'm not saying giving up three or four of them, but I'm saying you got to give up something to get something. Should they make the move to go get a starting pitcher that we've talked about ad nauseum? The answer is yes. I mean, uh, I, you know, I read about, and I think they've helped themselves by the two kids that yeah. they sign. But, but when I hear that Martinez is going to spring training as a starting pitcher candidate, if this is their idea, and I don't think it is, but it, if this were to be their idea of the guy that we feel we needed to go get to join four other young people in that rotation, that's not a good sign. I mean, all the names that this club has been linked to, and not only this club, but a lot of other clubs, uh, Glasnow and and Shane Bieber and Dylan Cease, and maybe there's some other ones that I'm not thinking of. Yeah, uh, uh, was it Michael Waka? Uh, there have been a bunch of guys' names have been thrown out there. Um, this is what I'm talking about, and I've said it for months uh, since the season ended. I truly believe you need a pitcher with a track record that has also the ability to be a major influence on young pitchers like Seaver was in the late 70s and like Bronson Arroyo year after year after year with this club. Um, and if they fall short of that for whatever the reason, and I, I would hope it wouldn't be the money aspect, if it were, uh, that then may well be an indication of what you were talking about relative to the TV situation earlier. I just sit, still think, and I read today where now they're talking about uh, the speculation, I think, in an article that Mark Sheldon wrote about uh, being interested in a switch hitting infielder. Well, how many of them are out there? Switch hitting infielder? Are you <laughs> kidding me? I, that's like going, we go, we're looking for a center fielder who has a PhD in aero, uh, aero uh, uh, nuclear engineering. Um, I, I just think that the pitcher is the priority. And, and if you can do that and whatever else you might be looking for, that was not a major priority. You just suck it up and go on with it. But um, I think they've helped the bullpen. I still think they need a starting pitcher with the attributes that I stated, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I don't know that I would say I'm a little concerned about the fact that they've done nothing other than the two relief pitchers, um, and I still get tired of them continually signing minor league players with an invitation to major leagues camp. I got to get so they, this kid, and I'm not knocking anybody. I'm using it as a generality. This Mark Mathias, they signed as a, as a uh, infielder. Uh, you know, he's a minor league contract with a invitation to spring training and making the big league club. They do it year after year after year. I don't know whether they do it with an eye toward improving their triple a club in Louisville or they genuinely believe that these guys have a chance there. And again, I'll go back to the fact the percentage of those guys that one make the club and stay with you all year and contribute relatively well are so minuscule. It's laughable. And, and I just, I don't understand that part of it, but I guess there's a method to their madness. I, I'm going to throw you, I'm going to throw you a curveball here a little bit before we bounce around the room. I, I'm just curious. You've been to every single major league park there is. You've been to all the cities. other than the new Texas park. Okay. Oh, well, maybe you've been though yeah. to Arlington, Texas. Yeah. Okay. But the, the point right. being, you've been to all the, the cities. If yeah. you were Shohei Otani and everything is exactly the same money, terms, whatever else you negotiate in the deal. Okay. And you're able to navigate through, which is always a big issue for players who are thinking about signing in Toronto because of the taxes. So let's just say that everybody's the same. All right? Years, money, yep. everywhere. Where would you go? Where would Marty Brenneman go and sign to play if you were Shohei Otani? I would go to the same place that I've said for months. 
I said from day one, he's going to end up in a Dodger uniform, and that's who I would sign with. Why would you say so these, in, are, these are little things that reasons. I think about? You don't you, you you think about them because they I mean you are as impatient as they come. Uh, that you know, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> and and you know, like like I always think to myself, all the games that I used to broadcast, like you did, and I would even do a few more because of you know Fox Saturday Baseball back in the day. And you got fifty five thousand yep. people. You're you, you're you're one of the players. They're in their players' parking lot, and because that parking lot is so big, now some people say, "What the hell are you talking about?" But it takes you an hour and fifteen minutes just to get out of the parking lot. It can take you that long after a game. Why would you subject yourself to that every day? And then and then an hour and something to drive in, or an hour and something. You can say, "Well, somebody else will drive you." That's fine. But I'm just saying, why would you do that? I'd stay in Anaheim. Uh, to begin with, if it takes uh, – are you done yet? No. I would stay in Anaheim. <laughs> you think he's going back to Anaheim? I think there's a legitimate chance he stays in Anaheim. Well, yeah, I, I, do. I don't know that that's uh, – you know what? I, I don't think that's unrealistic at all. Yep. Uh, I truly don't. But my point is this. When I say the Dodgers, I could almost say – and if Dodgers were number one, number one A, I would have, I should have said, would be, uh, would be Anaheim, because when I talk about the L.A. market, I'm including Orange County. Yep. And and my point is this: it's closer to his home in Japan. Yep. Secondly, the population, the Asian population in that area, is tremendous, and I really believe that that makes a difference to these young men that come over from playing in the Japanese league. Um, and, you know, I think there's a certain mystique about playing for the L.A. Dodgers. I there truly is. do. Yeah. Um, great ballpark. And as far as the other things are concerned, I, I'm always uh, mindful of Tommy Lasorda when he managed the Dodgers. He had a condominium downtown. He didn't have to drive anywhere. During the season, he lived in that condominium downtown. And and I don't I can't believe that a kid like Otani with the kind of money that he's going to get from whoever he goes with will certainly have enough money to buy himself a beautiful condominium in downtown Los Angeles and not have to fight that traffic if he's going anywhere to get home at night. As far as the hour plus it takes to get out of the clubhouse, uh, get out of the parking lot, they spend that much time in the clubhouse before they leave and go. Uh, some do. Some are out the door with their uniforms on, but. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't think that would be a deterrent whatsoever, but I think your point is well made, and that is that he could end up at the end of the day back in, in an Angels uniform. Well, you know, Tommy Lasorda was my guy, not so much your guy. I mean, not I so have a jersey I have a jersey over here, you know, to Tom. You are the greatest, Tommy Lasorda. Now you take that you are the greatest with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that about your own son? You don't get. We don't want to get on that subject now. I mean, I, I, I never. Uh, I don't you speak at well. the I end of the day, you at the end of the day, through all the stuff with Tommy. Okay, I'm convinced of this. You and I both know he was great for the game. He was great for the sport. There are no more Tommy Lasortas. There are no more Lou Pinellas. They're all a bunch of robots walking around and telling us about numbers. I want Tommy back. I don't disagree with that part of it, but uh, he ain't coming back. Well, <laughs> That's a certainty. He's not coming back. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, Tommy and I had our differences, and 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 they seem to linger. Uh, I don't disagree at all that he was anything but great for the game of baseball. I agree with that. Okay. Um, How many? But last thing I ask you about what? Are, what are all these bands you have on? I mean, you look like you're going to a uh, to a Taylor right Swift here? concert. Can you see them? Well, yeah. Let me tell you I, something. I how it have brought you. you look like you're going to Taylor Swift. I've got Dragonfly. Yep. I've got. Uh, I'm going to save the best for last. Um, let's see what else I've got. I've got uh, Pink Ribbon 2023. That's uh, you know in yep. honor of breast cancer right. awareness. I've got uh, teaming up against prostate cancer. Ed Randall, who's my good buddy from New York, yep. uh, he has this. And the last but not least, 
was given to me by Bill Carambellis. You know who Billy is? I do. Billy was our engineer in Chicago and is still today one of my dear friends. And when I retired, he gave me this one and gave me a whole bunch of them. And what it says is, what would Marty say? Oh, my God. That's it right there, Bubba. Oh, my God. (laughs) All right, let's bounce around the room. Uh, You're a good friend and mine. A lot of people saying that with Bally's going away, maybe Chatterbox Sports takes over the rights to the Reds games beginning in 2025, and that Elliot Rearing, a.k.a. the Zebra, should be part of the broadcast team. Zebra, good morning. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Marty, how you doing? I have, I have one of those, too. I've got a wristband as well. You know what they say about great minds, Marty? Uh-oh. Did we lose Marty? That's what Uh-oh. you ought to be wearing, Elliot. What do you, say it again. We lost your mic there. Say it again. It was going to be insulting. I said he ought to be wearing. What would Marty say? Okay, I'll wear that. Uh, a couple points. Okay. I, wanted, I, I heard you guys talking about Shohei. If I was Shohei personally, I would go to Oakland in their last year, and maybe he can help clean out the rats from the rafters. Maybe that would be fun for him. They'd pay him about $30, and that's about it. But I think it would be fun. Shohei and Oakland won last year before they moved to Vegas. Uh, secondly, Marty, I actually majored in aeronuclear engineering, as you called it. I majored in that at UC. Unfortunately, I think it was class number three. I raised my hand and asked a question, and the professor said, why are you so stupid? And then he kicked me out of the room, and then I had to go major in something else. I ended up majoring in communications, Marty, because I'm very good at talking, very good at it. And I think you would agree with that. I would not disagree with that one iota. And the story and the accompanying question that that professor asked you does not surprise me one <laughs> single bit. Yeah, Zero. that's fair. That's fair. All right. And, I, and I've got one real question. I've got one real question. Um, I, I know you're a baseball guy, Marty, but I'm a big football fan. I'm a big fan of the Cincinnati Bengals. And I found yes. that when, when, a team is, when a team is struggling, right, And you could say they're quote-unquote dead. The Bengals were dead. The chances were dead. Um, Some are saying that's because they were malnourished. Uh, Some were saying saying that maybe maybe what they were eating wasn't enough. And you could tell it on the field, Marty, because they were hungry. And and I look at the Jaguars. They've been fed well all, all season long. And, and, and you look at them, and, and they played like it, right? They were, they've been given every opportunity I know where you're to going. Eat, 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 a, eat a great meal. It just seemed like the Bengals were a hungry dog, and, and it looks like they ran a little <laughs> bit faster. I could be wrong, but that's what it appeared like to me, at least. Can I, Tom, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Don't ask me. He, he's the one talking to you. <laughs> You know, I, the only question I would ask after that, and I knew where he was going 35 seconds before he got to the point. <laughs> yeah. What the hell are we wasting all this time for? Well, I, I, Marty, it's important. I think it's important that we have this great discourse here. I, people, people, are, people are waiting for this. Is they that are. what you call this? A great, great dis- discourse? Great discourse. Uh, Marty, I should have gone to Red's Fest. I was debating it only to see you. I was going to go there. I was going to shake your hand, give you a hug, and I would have hugged you until you called security to drag me away. That's, that's how much well, the I one love thing you, I know, The one thing I can tell you without <laughs> yeah. any degree of doubt in my mind, and yeah. you were not missed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all fine. I can tell you. That's fine. That's all right. That, that's a good way to end it. Marty, I, I want you to know, no matter what happens between us, you, you're always my best friend. And I just wanted to end it with yeah, that. Yeah, well. And I, think I, the feel, I, 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 I don't want to speak for you. But I'll I think sleep the, better I, tonight, I, Elliot. Yeah, I think the feeling's mutual. You can tell it in your voice, in your eyes. Yeah, you sure can. Yeah. <laughs> Trace, Reed, uh, anything for the Hall of Famer? No, I, I I learned long ago, if you don't have a great question, sometimes it's best just to not yeah, ask one no in general. Uh, but I do want to say it's a holiday spirit. Uh, Marty, thank you for coming on the show time and time again, even though you're you're subject to, to just ridiculousness. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. I'm not too, not too sure. Maybe you come on just because you want to be a, a great dad and you help Tom out from yeah. time to time. But regardless, I just want to say thank you for coming on our program. Thank you for always supporting us at Chatterbox. And my only question, which may be a cheeseball question, is do you have any – like uh, any holiday kind of uh, 
uh, rituals or things that you do that kind of uh, get you in the spirit or, or, or kind of uh, bring a smile to your face? Well, not really. Um, and I appreciate your comments, Trace. And, uh, you, you know, as much as I like to help my boy, I enjoy doing this uh, every week. Uh, and, and when I have to miss a week for whatever the reason, it kind of makes me uh, all out of sorts because I enjoy this I, and I'm being serious now. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy being with these guys and, and uh, giving Elliot a hard time because obviously his life has a void and he needs somebody to give him a rough time. Um, so I enjoy that. As far as rituals for Christmas, uh, we started one this year, which I think is a great one. My wife, Amanda, is there's no bigger Halloween fan on earth than my wife. If you ask her what her favorite, uh, you know, day of the year is it's halloween and we have a we have halloween decorations all over the house we have a halloween tree uh with halloween decorations on it when we took that down and that was um probably the first week 10 days in november the christmas tree went up the same day and all these people are scurrying around and going out now to buy trees and dragging that nasty thing into the house and they're pine, you know, the, the needles are all over the place. We have a beautiful artificial tree with decorations. All of 98% of the decorations on our tree are uh, ornaments that we bought in our travels over the last five or six or seven years. And, and the tree is immaculate. Uh, that would be something that I hope we continue because it's nice to have that thing up. Uh, well before Thanksgiving, and then we take it down two days after Christmas comes and goes, and and we're off and running. But I don't I don't really have a lot of traditions. I like Christmas. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, getting together with my family uh, in in a couple of weeks at our home here in Anderson Township to celebrate Christmas because on Christmas Day people are all over the place. But um, you know I, I I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I think it's really fun. I look forward to it. I like the abuse that I take, and I get a lot of abuse. My son beats up on me, but he's done it so well that it's – it's, and I know when he's trying to light me up. See, the Tommy Lasorda thing was designed to light me up. I understand that, and I've learned how to deal with him over the years. In the old days, he could get me He could because I, I wasn't smart enough to figure out what he was doing. Now I understand, and so I play along, and everybody's happy, and he's happy. Not as happy as he used to be when he knew I would get seriously bent out of shape. I don't do that anymore. Uh, there may be a level of truth to all that somewhere along the line. but um, Yes, there is. Yep. Dad, uh, thanks for the time. Great to see you. Have a, a great day. All Hopefully right. we'll, we'll see you next week if you're around. And, uh, yes, and, sir. And have a good rest of your weekend. All right, you guys do the same thing. Elliot? Yes, Marty. Stay in I, good health, my man. Cause thank I don't you, want Marty. you to like – like Casey, I don't want you to miss the show. Okay. Anytime I'm on, you better be on. I will. Okay? And by the way, I, Marty, I want to ask you, because I a real, real last last question, Marty. My favorite Christmas song is Dominic the Donkey. Have you ever heard it? <laughs> what? The, the Christmas song is called Dominic the Donkey. Have you heard it? No, I have not. But if I'm on next week, which I think I am, okay. I want to be sure that, that you all have a copy of that and you can play it for my edification. Okay, that's what I will. All right, Marty. Goodbye, what, Marty. What I will tell you, Dad, is you, what you should do in the meantime is you should go to Elliot's X account and you should listen to him singing My Way by Frank Sinatra. Because I got to tell you, I think you're going to be impressed, and I'm not kidding. It's a big league rendition well, of My Way. That's fine, but he also re better be aware if he's not already – that there was never a bigger fan born on this earth for Frank Sinatra than I was. Ooh. And I stand, I stand alone today. I, I, was, I was a major fan of Sinatra, have all kinds of CDs and vital records of Sinatra's music. So I'm going to do that based on Tom's recommendation, Elliot. Okay. And it damn sure better. It damn sure better be it good. It is. It is. It'll be good, Marty. You'll like okay. it. You'll like it a lot. All right. And you can watch Dream Weaver somewhere in there of him in the hot tub this summer, uh, singing about Luke Dream Weaver. 
That was a big hit <laughs> uh, this friends. summer. All I right. bet it was. Yep. All right. Dad, have a good rest of your day. Thanks for the time. Love you. All right, See guys. You, soon. you all, all do right. the same. Be Take good. care. Have a good week. All right. You too. Boy, nothing better, is there? Nothing better. He's the best guest we have every week. Best, best guest by far, Tom. That's my best friend. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a one-way street. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, you know, my dad will say to me, hey, who's going to be around today? And I'm like, you know, the regular crew. So he's like, all right, Reed and Trace and Casey. And he says, and then is Elliot going to be there? It's like puts him in like a different category. <laughs> he's like the uh, – He doesn't care if I'm going to be there. He just wants to know, are you guys going to – and then is Elliot going to be there? <laughs> It's like the situation where uh, you have like the youth basketball team and you can quickly tell uh, usually whichever whichever coach is getting on one kid the hardest it's probably the one that's the most the most capable of handling it and or the best player. You can tell Marty has an, an affinity for Elliot just based off the fact that he, he does nothing but roast him. But I got to tell you, uh, Dominic the Donkey. You ever hear what that in song? the hell is Dominic the oh, Donkey? Oh, it's so good. It's so it's such a good song. Is this some I, crude thing or No, it's not a crude Jesus thing. Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Can we make on it the donkey? Are you making fun top. of donkeys? Sure. Do you want me to find can I No, find I, we'll find it. I'm okay. asking you. Is it are we is it going to get us in trouble? You you, well, United Do- Dairy I've Farmers never even call heard us. of it. You, you guys have never heard, heard of Dominic the Donkey. Ihan, no. Ihan. No, donkey. no. It, it is, is it is a one hundred percent child Christmas song. Perfect. All right. That's all I need to know. It is. Yeah. Really? Dominic the Donkey. You'd like it. You're going to like it. Yeah, we're going to play it today. It's, a, it's the best That's Christmas gonna be song there is. That's going to be our cherry on top today if we can find it somewhere. Okay? It's going to be great. It is going to be great. we got to get to uh, Brian Billick, um, our main man when it comes to everything that is the NFL. He, he, he's in such demand. We're lucky to be able to squeeze him in today. He's got radio. What are some of the big league radio hits you're doing today, Brian? You're tied up all day long. Give us a, just give us a thumbnail of some of the people – that are calling you from points around the globe or around uh, the galaxy today? Well, <laughs> this is my radio day. I do 15 shows. 15 uh, shows? I do uh, KDXA in Pittsburgh, KBME in Houston. I do um, Sirius Mad Dog Radio. I do Doug Gottlieb, Dan Barrero in Minnesota, The Fan in Cleveland, uh, The Fan in San Francisco, Mile High Sports in Denver, Oh. Uh, Fox Sports Radio, and then Cirrus with Bob Papa, and in Baltimore with uh, the fan and Jason Lockenfora. I'm all oh. over it, man. Holy Moses. You know, you just made me think of something here real quick. In Cleveland right now, okay, Bengals are now only one game behind both Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and like the Bengals, Cleveland and Pittsburgh are now faced with the dilemma of a backup quarterback. They brought in Joe Flacco. Were you surprised by that, or did you think, why not? Well, why not? And boy, he looked pretty good. He did. I mean, he, he could still still spin it, you know. And and uh, uh, I thought he was very impressive, along with Browning from Cincinnati. Talk about backups coming into a difficult situation, still have expectation. Teams that are, you know, Cleveland, Indy, Houston, Denver, Buffalo, Cincinnati. That's a new division now. That's the AFC Wild Card Division, because you know, I, I, Cleveland, Cincinnati, they're not going to catch Baltimore necessarily. Um, uh, Indianapolis is, you know, right there with Jacksonville. But so really, and, and it's a wide open field, you know, when you're talking that range. So Cincinnati and Cleveland are still and doing it with backup quarterbacks. But I thought Joe Flacco looked outstanding. Well, Flacco's a winner. I mean, a proven winner. I mean, I think he took his team to the playoffs his first six years in the league. It's all it's an all time record. He's won a Super Bowl. I mean, his resume speaks for itself. But it, it also speaks to the fact, I think, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you're the GM in Cleveland or you're the head coach, Kevin Stefanski, you're saying, okay, we've seen P.J. Walker. We've seen Dorian Thompson-Robinson. Uh, you know, our, we got to go for it now. And, and our best avenue is to go for it with a guy that was just, you know, uh, you know uh, cutting his lawn two weeks ago. Yeah, because you're still about, you know, you're still in the thick of it. And, and why wouldn't you go with the veteran guy that you think gives you the best chance? You're not in the point of yet – Fortunately, compared to some of these teams, New England, Tennessee, and the Jets, where it's well, we got to find out about some of these guys. Well, they're not there, and and this is this is very. I mean, they're right there, and this is this is you know Pittsburgh's, you know they're their backup, Cleveland, Cincinnati. So you got a lot of backups. Indianapolis has their backup. Uh, Houston, of course, does. Houston, how impressive is Houston? Yeah. And CJ Stroud, I and mean, that's that's a good looking team. 
Um, so yeah, it's 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 interesting, uh, and and they're they're right there. They're very very viable. And uh, now, how far they'll go in the playoffs and that type of thing, but that's not the point right now. Uh, you got to sell the team, and the team knows that. The team wants to go and hey, we've seen Flacco. Yeah, let's go with this guy because we can win with this guy. We're not into developing these other guys. We want to win now. How good is Baltimore? I can look at their record. The Bengals have played them twice. They've beaten them twice. Uh, Baltimore's beaten the Bengals twice. Uh, I've been saying uh, for the last four or five weeks, the more you watch them, I don't know how, the more you don't like them. I I think they're the best team in the AFC. Oh, uh, no question about that in my mind. I mean, Miami can make claim, lay claim to it. We saw Jacksonville stumble against Cincinnati. Um, Kansas City, who just, you know, Kansas City is interesting. They're just, everybody's wondering, well, why why aren't they, why everyone's good? Well, they're just not as explosive as they were. They don't, they're not generating those big plays. They're still a very, very good team. Don't, don't get me wrong. And they're going to be in, in the hunt of it. But I think Baltimore, top to bottom, the ability to run the ball, playing good defense, uh, they are throwing the ball better because they got a better receiving core. Now, they've taken some hit when they locked, lost Andrews at tight end. But, no, I don't think there's any question uh, that they and, – and their schedule is such that they're built to – you know, I, I, that's why I say I don't think Cleveland, Cincinnati, not to cut them short, but I, I don't think they're going to catch Baltimore. No, no, Lord, no, they're not catching Baltimore. Um, if you're Sirianni in Philadelphia, you're ten and one. A lot of people feel like they haven't played their best football of the year. Uh, the Forty ers come rolling into town. They've got everybody healthy for the for- first time, and they blow you out of the gym uh, uh, on your own home floor, so to speak. Well, if you're Sirianni. What do you say to the team? Because there's a good chance you're going to see that team in that matchup again, and you probably get them back at home if you continue to win because they're still behind you for the number one seed in the NFC. Yeah, and then they got to go to Dallas and play Dallas right now. So they're you know they're in that thick of it. They're what they're going to I, what I would do is simply sit down and show them the the five or six plays that cost them. That guys, look, we've 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 done this better. We don't do this. And then show them five or six plays where, that you've done very well. This is who we are. Now, we're playing the big boys now. We're in the A division. We just played an A division team. We're about to play an A division team in, in our division uh, in, in Dallas. So we, we need these latter six plays because we're capable of that. That aside, San Francisco, how, how impressive mm. was that? And Brock Purdy, I mean, this, this guy, it, it's amazing. His, his box score looks like a Ben Roethlisberger-esque he only threw it 27 times, but he had over 300 yards and four touchdowns. He leads the league in yards per attempt. And he had ex- five explosive plays to five different guys. That's what impresses me. He had better than 20. He had a 40, a 50-yarder to Debo Samuel, a 30-yarder to George Kittle. He had a, a 30-yarder to, to Christian McCaffrey. He had a 20-yarder to, to Juan Jennings, whoever the hell that is. You know, that just tells you <laughs> – You know, playing good defense. They ran the ball for 146 yards, and they're getting big chunks on not a lot. I mean, that that on the road against Philadelphia, maybe the best team in the in the in the league. Some people would argue that that was an impressive performance. Hey, I'm kind of curious when you bring up something like this because you know, look, all of the sports today, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, whatever, they're they're so flooded, and we're all flooded with numbers and stats, right? And that's okay, that's fine. But when you look at a quarterback season line, okay. And, you know, you've, you've got completion percentage there, which a lot of people don't talk about, but, but people who really are in football mode, they really pay attention to that. Okay, completion percentage, yards, touchdowns to interceptions, and then yards per attempt. How big a deal is that yards per attempt when you're looking at a quarterback and how, how well he's playing or not playing? It's, it's bigger than completion percentage to me. I mean, completion percentage is important because you want to show a certain amount of efficiency. But if you're if you're four, five, six yards a completion, you're just dinking and dunking. Well, you know that. What is that really proving at the end of the day? You know, it goes back to our toxic, right? Back when you and I were yep, working, yep. big plays and turnovers, and, and it's an interactive. You got to get big plays, not give up the big plays, not turn the ball over, and get turnovers. So if you can if you can not turn the ball over, you have a high completion percentage. Uh, which Brock, Brock Purdy does. That's the amazing thing. He's he's seventy percent completion, but he leads the league with almost ten yards per attempt. Yeah, uh, and twenty three touchdowns and six interceptions. That's that's the trifecta you're looking for. I mean, you can throw the ball up 
you know, uh, Baker Mayfield throws the ball all over the place. And, and he comes up with a lot of big plays, but he also turns the ball over and he has a lot of incompletions. So, um, you know, C.J. Stroud is one that that's impressive because his, you know, he, his completion percentage needs to come up a little bit. And a lot of young players, that'll happen. He's just over 60 percent, but he's averaging 8.5 per attempt. And he's got 20 touchdowns to five interceptions. So the completion percentage will come with him and, and will step up a little bit. But that touchdown to interception ratio I mean, it's, uh, you know, Purdy and, and C.J. Stroud and, Pr- and Purdy being, you know, last pick of the draft and all that. Now, he's on the perfect team. They're going to run the ball. They're going to play good defense. But the, And you would think that you would see from him then a guy that's high completion percentage, dink and dunk and underneath, play good defense, run the ball, and that's how we'll win. But he's, he's taking his shots mm-hmm. and hitting them. It's impressive. All right, last thing I want to ask you about for Bengal fans. You know, I, I mean, Brian, you've forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. I, I, I've been fortunate to watch a lot of football and call a lot of football. That game the other night that Browning had was as unbelievable a game by a player where you never saw it coming that I have ever seen. 32 of 37, 354. He was just remarkable in that game. Now, uh, the, the game before... His numbers weren't that bad. He threw a key pick, but that was his first start in fairness of his NFL career, and you had a full week as a number one guy, et cetera, et cetera. It, what, what, are, what are reasonable expectations now for Browning? Because people around here are well, losing their mind. Yeah. Right. Well, because we – and we and we will, of course, because we always annoy, oh, this is the next coming and, and whatever. Having said that, you're right. That, that was an impressive performance. You're talking about efficiency, 32 of 37 – for 350 yards. They ran the ball very well. They ran for over 156 yards and they had five explosive plays. So, you know, against a good Jacksonville team. So yeah, this, the the expectation is there now. Now with any quarterback that comes into this situation and and before we get all, uh, you know, before we start slam dunking them into the hall of fame, it's, it's okay. Can, can you sustain it now? Can, can you do it? That, that's the key. Anybody can step in and just, you know, have th- that kind of game. But Indianapolis is in Cincinnati now. Again, good football team, pretty good defense. They're at home. So, yeah, now it's it's like in tennis. They say it's not a break unless unless you consolidate, right, with the next game. Mm-hmm. Fine, you can break somebody's serve, but if you give up your serve the next one, then it's no break. Well, okay, can you consolidate? Can you, can you uh, come home and do the same thing against Indianapolis? Now we're going to be saying, okay, yeah, this, 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 this thing could be real. Brian, we appreciate the time as always. Your insight is just remarkable, my friend. Uh, busy day for you. Enjoy it. Tell Kim and everybody hello, and we'll catch up next week. All right, All right man. Sounds good. Thanks. Brian Billick, Super Bowl winning head coach from the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, I, you know, that, that, I, I love hearing some of that inside stuff because – You know, look, we talk about it, guys, all the time uh, when it comes to um, sports and all the numbers that we're just overwhelmed with. And I'm so glad he brought that thing up about yards per attempt because we were talking early in the year, if you remember, where Joe Burrow's yards per attempt were like at four and a half. Yeah. Right? And here we are, guys like Purdy and Stroud, and they're at eight and a half and ten. And for those, I, I know there's some, I, I don't want to talk down ever to anybody because I, I don't like when other people do it. And I, I certainly don't ho- hope you don't think. I, I hope you understood the connection there when he's talking about when you look at that number, most of the time, the higher that number is, yards per attempt, the lower a quarterback's completion percentage is going to be because it is a much higher likelihood of being incomplete on throws down the field than dumping it off to the running back on a screen or a wide receiver screen or a three-yard slant, all those kinds of things, which is basically what the Bengals were doing uh, while Burrow was hurt. Now that started to change. Uh, Reed, we haven't heard from you all day long. I'm curious, you know, uh, when he said that he thinks that that is even more important than completion percentage, I couldn't believe it. Uh, yeah, Be- I'm going to do the case. Okay, all right, there you go. You want to look good. You want to look good. Right, I don't even know if I'm in frame. I got to go You don't even have a T-shirt on today, the, you know, the 
the medium t-shirt on today. <laughs> it was it was, and, it was a little know. tight. Listen, my wife buys my clothes. That's the stuff she likes to see me in. And and you know, hey, she's, hey, she's the only hey. one. She's the only opinion I care about. Amen, brother. Amen. But. You know, and yeah, I, you know, Jake Browning, we talked about it. His first eight passes were behind the line of scrimmage. And, and yeah, there was some yards after, after the completion there. But it, anyone can, can throw in the flats and can run these screens. And are you hurting the team? That's what it comes down to. And that's where yards per completion, yards per attempt really come. Are you hurting them in the pass game? Or are you just dinking and dunking? Tom Brady threw 55 passes a game last year, but he wasn't a real right. vertical threat yep. as a quarterback. And he mentioned Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield's kind of doing the same thing in the same offense over in Tampa Bay. That's what we saw in Jake Browning against the Steelers. A lot of passes, not a lot downfield, not getting downfield, but certainly you you need to see some vertical threat in a quarterback. And yeah, that's what we saw in the second half with Jake Browning on Monday. You know, I wanted to follow it up, but he was short on time. I really wanted to get into something we've debated around here uh, more and more, but e even without asking him, I think that you could hear he acknowledge the fact that, yeah, it's good for Purdy to be playing in San Francisco. They've got a lot of good players around him. And, I mean, there are players on that team, uh, Samuel, the best example perhaps in the NFL, where you throw a wide receiver screen and there's a chance this cat's going to bust it for 75 yards. I mean, he's just that talented, big, strong, fast, et cetera, yards after catch. And I think the Niners lead the league in, in yards after catch uh, with their receivers so far this year. But, but clearly, Trace, he ain't buying uh, the argument that many have out there. And look, I'm not going to sit here and say that the people who make this argument are wrong, but it sounded like he ain't buying that idea that Brock Purdy some system quarterback. No, I, I it, like I said yesterday, I genuinely think that there's a lot of guys, a lot of guys that are capable of being a serviceable NFL quarterback. I, it, it's hard for me to believe in a world of athletes that, that are all chasing, I mean, millions upon millions of kids or whatever are chasing the goal of being an NFL quarterback. It's really hard for me to believe there's only eight or nine of them that can serviceably do a job in the NFL I, 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 do I think that there's the only a few elite, 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 elite that can get by and maybe they can cover up holes that other guys can't? Yes, of course. And, and we know who those guys have been over the course of history. Your, your Montanas, your Bradys, your, your, your Elways. We can, we can go through that list. Joe Burrows. Joe Burrow. I'm not going to go there yet, <laughs> but, but I will, I will at some point. And I think that Joe Burrow ha has looked amazing for a couple years. And you know my opinion on sustainability. I, I'd like to see it over a course of 10 years before I put him along the, along the lines of Brady's and, and, and uh, Manning's of the world. But my main point to you, Tom, is, is that there are more Brock Purdy's out there. It comes down to, do you find, is there going to be a culture that you come into that, one, has the patience to let you develop a little bit, and two, allows you the time to understand the offense before they just start ripping it apart. You look at the Panthers organization, they fire their head coach after four games. You know, uh, I think Baker Mayfield came into this league, Tom, and I'm pretty sure off the top of my head he had four different coordinators yep. and three different head coaches. Like, mm -hmm. you can't win in this league yep. if there's not some kind of form of consistency. And that is, at least if anything, what the Bengals have done over the last whatever it's been, two decades. They have had, they have given patience. Whether you like Marvin Lewis or you didn't like Marvin Lewis, Brown gave him time, and he did the same thing with Zach Taylor. So, you know, I, I, I think, if anything, there's more guys like Brock Purdy than there are of guys like uh, Zach Wilson. Speaking of Zach Wilson, uh, that whole story I, I find to be just fascinating. And we're going to talk a lot about the, uh, the, the Bengals in the second part of the hour, hour some red stuff. Uh, we're going to get to Xavier. Boy. Whoopsie. Man. They look good, don't they, Tom? I just, you know, um, we'll, we'll get to that after 11. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know how many of you are paying attention to this Jets thing. So the story comes out from an anonymous source. It's like people on, you know, Twitter or X that don't put their real name because they have no courage whatsoever. Uh, you know, they, they want to spew off hate and they want to make a bunch of, you know, hot takes, but they won't put their name on it. Um, but anonymous sources painted a story in the New York paper, I believe it was a post, two days ago, that 
Robert Sala made the decision they weren't going to play Tim Boyle at quarterback anymore. They just cut him loose. He started a couple of games after Wilson had been benched. We know the struggles of Wilson since being a number one pick out of BYU. Um, a story developed that Wilson did not want to start anymore this season because the risk of injury with this team the way it's set right now, and Wilson will be cut loose at the end of the year. There's no doubt about that. He will be a free agent, and he's hoping to get another job and start a new life, if you will, somewhere else and hoping for better times and better days. So that story leaks out. Then there's a story that Wilson comes to Robert Sala and says, I want to start. So you've got juxtaposed, and some are trying to connect the dots, saying the only reason he went to Sala was because he didn't want to start. So then Aaron Rodgers comes on Pat McAfee yesterday. And man, I mean to tell you, for a guy who's signing, getting, getting a paycheck from an organization, which Rodgers is from the New York Jets, he lit into the Jets' front office and quote-unquote leakers, or whoever they are, and say if this organization is ever going to be anything, these kinds of stories cannot be leaked out. And I mean, Aaron Rodgers really went to bat for Zach Wilson yesterday. He says, this is a great kid. I've been around him a ton. He cares. We know the struggles he's had. He said, there is no way on God's earth that this guy said he wasn't going to start a football game if he was asked to do so. Now, the story then goes on to say, this may have started, which means the leaks are coming from players that there was basically a conversation that Wilson was having with a teammate that was saying, man, you know, whoever goes out there and plays quarterback for us right now, you're taking your life into your own hands the way things are going right now. I just think this is really, I I just think this whole thing, it's just so indicative uh, of people just out to defame the character of other people. And I do, maybe Zach Wilson did do it. I don't know. Quite honestly, I don't care. But, 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 but who, what's the upside for anybody in that Jets organization, whether it was a player, whether it was somebody in the front office that was, you know, that was in the meeting with Sala and the general manager and the the offensive coordinator and all these kind of people about what they're going to do just to get a starting quarterback on the field for this coming Sunday's game. What did you guys think about all that? Did you, I mean, have you read much about it to say much about it or think much about it? I just, when I watched Rogers yesterday and I infrequently watch that show, but when Rogers is on there, it's incredible TV. Because Rodgers, whether you like the guy or don't, he, he is not backing down to anybody, ever. And he'll just lay it out there, whatever's on his mind. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, he doesn't give a damn. Did you see any of it? Uh, I, I did not see it. I do think that they're, obviously in the chat, people are saying that Tim Boyle is the one that uh, the, the Jets organization feels like leaked that information, so that's why he got cut. I don't know. I can't confirm nor deny that. I, I do think, Tom, though, you're in a situation similar to Iowa footballs of the world. It's like... Uh, that 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 it's it's hard to keep a clubhouse or a locker room intact when you have an elite side of one of one side of the ball that you could make the case that they could win a Super Bowl with, and they no doubt could win a Super Bowl with that defense that the Jets run out there each and every Sunday. The issue is at some point you can't help but become overly frustrated if the other side of the ball is so bad you've won four games. Yeah. It, it can't become that bad, right? And, and, and unfortunately for the Jets, they thought they had their answer with Aaron Rodgers. And, and, and like it or not, whether he was going to be the guy or, 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 or was or wasn't, they presumed that, they, that, they, that he was going to be that. So their, their expectations and their aspirations, it's almost like the terrible analogy of the day. You know, your kids think that they're getting ready to go over to Kings Island and they're all getting ready to get in the car and they're, you're halfway there and you're like, all right, guys, well, we're not going anymore. We got to turn around and go home. We can't go there anymore. And that and, and and like it or not, those kids are going to start throwing a fit. And there's no doubt in my mind you can call them adults or whatever you want. 
there's going to be some adults in that locker room that are going to start throwing little hissy fits as well. And it's impossible, for my opinion, to keep that many men in one locker room um, convinced or believing that yeah. they should that they should remain professionals when ultimately they're unbelievably frustrated. It's got to be hard, man. Yeah, I, the, the Zach Wilson saying <clears throat> he didn't want to start again thing, I don't know. Again, I don't know what the real real reason is. I would imagine a large part of it has to do with that he just can't take the ridicule anymore. I, I think it's – and, again, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's, 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 it's not a Jake Browning situation. You know what Zach Wilson is, and what Zach Wilson is is not a very good quarterback. I think he's a professional athlete. I think he's very good at football. But when it comes to the professional level, it's clear he's not good at being a leader. He, again, I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to hurt his character. But it, it's evident that not a whole lot of people in that locker room have a, have a ton of respect for him. And, and I don't think he wants to keep dealing with the, the ridicule of getting benched and start and benched and started back and forth nonstop. It's a disaster. That's, 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 a, that's a disaster. Yeah. It is. And, uh, you know, whether or not Rodgers ends up coming back and exposing himself to all of that when all is said and done, he's practicing. He's not been cleared to hit uh, after rupturing his Achilles in the opening game of the season, first series of the season. And um, we'll see. But, I, you know, I, I at least – I always like if, if somebody out there is not afraid to stick up for somebody else. And, again, look, I don't want Zach Wilson as my quarterback because he, he, he hasn't proven that he can play in this league. But, man, when you go out and you say that somebody is ducking, playing, that is a serious character assassination. That's like the worst thing. There are worse things you can do in the world. But inside of a locker room, one of the worst things, maybe the worst thing, that you can have attached to your name is being a guy that doesn't want to play. Right? No doubt. Even when you're in no high doubt. school, college, pro, it makes no difference. And, uh, and that's what somebody did to Zach Wilson. Speaking of playing, do you think, Tom, do you feel like Aaron Rodgers should risk going out there if he's the clear to play? You like, know, I can't – you know, I, I, I never speak to guys on what they should or shouldn't do through injury because I don't know what their thinking is. I mean, Rodgers signed this huge contract there. Um, you know, does, does he feel like he needs to, uh, you know, come back to prove to himself – or to some other people that I was able to come all the way back and I can still be a decent player and have a good game or two. Against the risk of, which we know what it is, because that offensive line is just brutal. And they were brutal the first game of the season. Anybody, if you go back and watch that game, and you only have to watch about five plays, if you go back and watch the first game of the year, every time that Rodgers caught the ball out of the shotgun, he was getting mauled within two and a half seconds. And ultimately, it leads to him blowing a... Uh, Achilles tendon. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what he's going to do. I still think he's got good football left in him, though, whether it's this year or next year, because he will come back wanting to play and wanting to produce again. He can't leave like this. It's kind of like Votto. Votto's not going to leave like this. You know, he said, if the game proves to me next year I'm healthy and I'm back at 100% and I go hit 198 again, then the game is proven I'm done. But he says, I don't think I'm done, and I, I think Rodgers certainly doesn't think he's done. And, and Rodgers had a much better year last year than a lot of people give him credit for. Wasn't a very good team. He wasn't great, but he certainly wasn't awful. So we'll see. We'll see. All right, we got some ad reads. Uh, when we come back, uh, the Crosstown shootout is this Saturday. Uh, everybody's going to be fired up about it. Sean Miller. Ooh. Did you hear his comments after the game last night? I give it up to him. I give it up to him. We, you know, we kid a lot about him being on the show and all that. But the guy I've always said is a great coach. Uh, but last night, I don't know if I've ever heard a, a more defeated coach in my life than he was on that post-game radio show last night with Joe Sunderman and Byron Larkin. It, it was, it was un. You talk about a guy just laying it out there. And now he's got to find a way to get his team ready to go when they practice here on a Wednesday for the undefeated University of Cincinnati Bearcats coming to CentOS on Saturday. Bearcats look good. And I think for the first time in a long time, they've got some players' personality on that UC team this year that I think are going to be ready for that environment. If you watch UC play at all this year, 
the two guards they've got on that team, Jizzle James and Day Day Thomas, mm-hmm. these guys are going to come to play. No doubt. Now, they may be awful on Saturday, first time they've been in the shootout. But those two cats ain't backing down to anybody in any environment. We'll get into all that when we come back. Reed, are, yep. you, gonna, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's I go. I mean, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go, Tom. You're dialed in. I'm ready to roll. You, you, you're the, uh, the, the Swiss Army knife of Chatterbox Sports. Yeah, yeah. A lot, lot of gadgets on a Swiss Army knife. None of them can, can get you through something that you really, <laughs> when you really need a knife. You don't go to the Swiss Army knife. When you really need a corkscrew, you really don't go through the Swiss Army <laughs> knife. But, sir, it does a lot of things. Uh, we talked a lot about the NFL. Um, we're going to talk about the Crosstown Shootout. So we'll say it's a Bengals Bearcats report, and that is brought to you by Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data center world with a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work from com- work from home computing modules to improve efficiency and productivity. Pr- productivity. Yeah. Visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins not over there, not over there, but here. Um, yeah, and then also we are sponsored by Pawnee Water. You know, I don't have their ad read right in front of me, but I don't have to have an ad read in front of me to no, just you tell you about how great this water is. I mean, it says on the bottle, best tasting water in the world, because it is. It's a bottle right here, right across the street in Hamilton, Ohio. It has a pH level of 8. It's the natural limestone filtration that gets it to that. All these other bottles of water, they have an artificial processing. It's natural limestone filtration here with Pawnee. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you go into – seriously, here's a science experiment for you. Yes. Go into a – Science. Go into a convenience store, science. pull out a, just a bottle of water, one of those high-end bottles of waters, and go and look what the ingredients say. Mm-hmm. It's not going to say just water. You pull out a bottle of wa- Pawnee, ingredients, water. That's all they got. There That's go. all they got in the bottle. Do we have any ad reads or um, super no, chats? No, I was uh, – uh, super chats. Uh, we do have some super chats. I've seen some super chats at the beginning of the show. It was just one. Uh, one, one member uh, of the month, Yash. Yash. Is it Yash or Yash? I've done this like 9,000 times. I know he's our overseas friend, uh, Yash. So thank you for being a nut cutter. Also, I just want to say thank you for all the people that are members. When you're a small organization like we are, which we are, that sometimes people think we're bigger than we are, and that's all good and great. Um, we try to appear like you know we are, we know what we're doing. We we try to make our studio look nice. We want to make sure our content looks great. But at the end of the day, it's just a small group of people that are running around with their heads cut off trying to do the best we can. So when you support us and you uh, you become a member, it really does help help us. And uh, I just want to say right now we have 10.6 thousand subscribers. It is free. To hit the subscribe button on YouTube. To become a member, obviously, it costs a little bit of coin. But you do get perks like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, you get box lunch. And we are obviously going to add some things to that as we progress as well. Uh, but it's free to subscribe on YouTube. If you don't mind, just hit the subscribe button. I would love to get to 11K. Uh, 11K right around New Year's. We are averaging right around 350 new subscribers a month. So over a 28-day period, 350 uh, um, I don't do great at math, but 350 is just short of 11,000. So if we do just better than our average, we will get to 11,000, and that would be really, really cool. So thank you to everybody that watches the show. I know we say that um, you know, here and there sporadically, but the, the holiday season, when it gets cold, it gets dreary out, put up the Christmas tree. Sometimes maybe it's a, a better time of the year to be thankful more than others, but I just want to say people that watch this show each and every day, thank you for doing that. I know that uh, – you know, you might get tired of hearing us say that from time to time, but sincerely, um, who knows where this goes ultimately. Maybe in five years we're, 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 we're much larger than what we are right now, and maybe five years we're um, all working accounting jobs. I don't know what we're going to be doing. We'll figure it out as we go. But thank you for supporting us, and um, please subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell if, if, uh, if you've already subscribed. It is uh, free to do, and speaking of free, because the Bengals won on Monday, we made a promise that the next Box Lunch would be free. So today's edition of Box Lunch will be free to, to all subscribers. So just wow. at, at the end of this show, um, Elliot's going to be hosting that one. So we'll have a free Box Lunch. It'll be a fun little show. You want to give us a little preview of that today? Is there anything that you're going to be covering that we are not today? Well, I'm going to cover some of the stuff that we're going to cover. I, I'm going to probably do it in a, in a different manner than you will. But I'll, I'll be talking about Xavier. Give me one bit. topic that'll be done in, to give people who haven't seen Box Lunch. Sure. Let's just pick any topic. 
So, it, well, I, I have my topics. How will it be different than how we handle it? Well, on because the I'm going to talk about. Because there's got to be a differentiation yeah, in shows, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, like, you're going to talk about Xavier, and you're going to be very respectful. I'm going to talk about Xavier, <laughs> and I'm going to be less respectful. That's 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 the that's that's the preview. Now, I, I now I'm, it's my friend Mouse Cop, I'm very sorry for what's happening over there. It seems like it's a real disaster. Um, He's back today. And I tried. Listen, I, I, I tried to support Xavier last night. They were down like 10 points to some team from Delaware. And I am like, you know what? I'm going to bet on Xavier Moneyline. They're underdogs right now. I think they can do it. They pulled a little closer. I'm like, I think they're going to do it, Tom. So I bet a little bit more. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep riding this Xavier wagon until they win this game because I support them. You did this last night. I did this last night. And you know How what they many did, bets Tom? did you ultimately make? I bet two bets on Xavier. So you were 0 for 2. I lost them both. And I just tried to believe in them, but they couldn't believe in themselves. It's, a, as Sean Miller said, uh, a leaderless locker room. It's tough to hear. What a terrible set of events that has transpired here in the past. Three straight home losses for here the Xavier Musketeers. Spin, UC finally has a team good enough to beat Xavier, and they've got everything to lose. They should win this game by 15 or 20. Will they do that? I don't know. I don't know. They haven't won in CentOS Center in 22 years, so we'll see. It would just be it would be very embarrassing. More embarrassing than losing to Oakland and Delaware at home would be losing to a team like Xavier on the road. Sean Miller said they don't have any bye games in the in the post game press conference. He said these are all tough opponents. Del- Delaware was tough. <clears throat> they were tough last night. Losing to this Xavier team, who has lost once again three straight games at CentOS. Mm would be the epitome of brutality. Now, see, we, we know this <laughs> That's bit. That's original. Okay, you know, as a, as a Xavier fan, setting yourself up for, you know, potential loss. Uh, and I get it. I do it all the time. Um, you know, the, the funny thing is, though, is, and I said this to you before the show, Reed, and we were talking about mm-hmm. it. You know, this is the kind of game where, you, where really you look at Xavier's season and they're four and five. They've lost three consecutive home games, as you mentioned. Yep. Two against, you know, overwhelming underdogs in Oakland and then last night to Delaware. Uh, and sandwiched in between, you had Houston, fifth-ranked team in the country. They were here, they were six. now they're fifth. You could make the argument, even with their wins this season, two of their better-played games this year came against the top – two of the top five teams in the country. They played at mm-hmm. Purdue – which they competed there. There's no doubt about that. Sure. They didn't win, but they competed. And they certainly uh, – th- that Houston game was a fascinating game because, you know, if you watch it, and I watched a ton of it, you know, Houston, you know, jumps out to like a 16-4 to four lead. And then X gets back within one or two, right? Even takes a lead, mm-hmm. one or two. Then Houston goes on another big run, and they get up 12 or 14, and you think, oh, okay, here we go. They're going to blow them out. And then wham, Xavier's right back. This is the kind of game to me, the Crosstown Shootout, we're going to talk a lot more about it this week. This is a kind of game to me that I would not be surprised to see Xavier play their best basketball in this game. That's uh, kind of who they've been for a long time. Tom, if you have any source of pride in, in your home arena, if you have any pride in, in, in your program, then, yeah, you've, you've got to show out for this game. You, you talk about the Houston in the Purdue game for, for the Xavier Musketeers. Listen, college basketball, we're about a month into it, and the two most impressive performances this year were those losses yeah. to Houston and they Purdue. They were great. They were great losses. Uh, I mean, across the country. I mean, don't, don't talk about uh, Kansas beating They'll talk about those UConn. losses all year long. Right. Those are, those are impressive performances against Houston. And, but, but seriously, um, you know, when you got teams that – when you got players that are new – it's, it's hard to sometimes get them to, to show out for these Delaware games, for these Oakland games. And, and people can say whatever they want. Sean Miller can say that there's no buy games. you got to win games when you're at home and are 13-point uh, favorites. you got to win those games. But it's not hard. It really isn't hard to get young players, inexperienced players, to get up for you know, big atmospheres. Going to Mackey Arena and playing number one team in the country in Purdue, that's not hard to get up for it because you know it's at stake. When you're welcoming the number five team in the country in the Houston Cougars, that's not hard to get up for. You know it's at stake. When you're playing your crosstown rival, a rival that you haven't lost to in how many years, Elliot? I don't know. A lot, a lot. When you haven't lost at home. I five. I don't know. When you haven't lost at home to that team in 22 years, you Mm -hmm. know what's at stake 
So yeah, if, if four years, four years is what it is. It's four, been it's five. yeah yes yeah COVID since COVID they haven't won. Um, but yeah, they know what's at stake. They're going to come up. They're COVID they're going to play. This I is a really long winded say, uh, way of saying that Xavier's just trash. They're, 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 Xavier is not good at basketball this year. It, 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 we can say whatever you want, polish it however you want, do whatever you want. Right. But the fact of the matter is, if you no take one's... Xavier's name off the uniform and you put him in a Mount St. Joe's uniform, then uh, <laughs> then we'd be, be basically be on the same page this How year. How disrespectful! Boy. How disrespectful! They're terrible. How about that? They are terrible. Well, there, there's nothing left to say about it. So if Xavier yes. wins on Saturday, there's really what would that nothing make you left see? to talk about. I mean, if we want to sit here and talk about the what Crosstown shootout, see? let's talk about it. I mean, what is there to talk about? One if team. Xavier wins. The fact of the matter is this: it's simple. Listen, there's one team that's that's going like that. There's one team that's going like that. It's not hard to figure out whether Xavier will rebound. I don't know, but I do know this: if you're going to give Sean Miller all the credit for for taking a team over that was Travis Steele's guys last year and resurrecting them and going out to the portal and getting a couple guys, then you can also say the opposite. I mean, he's been there. There's transfer portal. I I don't want to hear the excuses of uh, this, that, and the other. Yeah. Okay. At I the agree. end of the day, this Xavier team should not be this bad. Okay, but 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 in fairness, okay, yeah. in fairness, you're you're right. Two of the I would say their best two. Two of their best three players. Say, and, and he would say two of the best three. I still say their best two players. And this would be based on what they've actually done on the floor. I think Claude's going to have a big year. But what they've done on the floor in their careers, their two best players are not playing at all this year. Mm-hmm. They're playing Delaware. Well, I, I, I mean, I what understand. the hell are we I talking about? The Blue Hens. They've, the they've, blue they've lost to blue Delaware. <laughs> At home, by the way. I mean, they played the Delaware at home. And, and, and what was the other team they just lost at home to? The that, Oakland that, Grizzlies. That, the Oakland Grizzlies that everyone's telling me how great they are and they're picked to finish fourth in the horizon. It's a tough league. Uh, so, listen, I, I, I'm all for giving people praise when they deserve praise, but to yeah. polish this up and sit here and say that you don't have any leadership in the locker room, this, that, and the other, you just don't have great basketball players. Call it what you want. Call it what you want. Yeah, you don't have good leaders. What the hell does that even mean? You you mean to tell me you need great leadership to beat Delaware? You could roll out a basketball in Kansas and and Bill Self and the rest of the staff, and same with goes with other places, and literally say, hey, the five worst toxic players we got, let's send them out there for 40 minutes and they're going to beat Delaware. You know why? Because they're just better basketball players. You sit here and blame kids all you want. I don't buy it. If you want to say he's calling his team out, he's trying to get them fired up, go ahead. He did it against Oakland too. It's not going to work. He has bad basketball players. Go get better basketball players. And I don't understand all the uh, the people in the chat saying it's more Cincinnati sports hate and all that kind of stuff. And they no think wonder that I Sean hate Cincinnati Miller sports. won't come on. And, you know, look, guys, you know, we, we say it all the time. When, you know, I'm not going to go as far as maybe Trace did to say that, you know, they're like done because I do think Miller is a phenomenal coach and I think he'll find a way to bring this group moving forward to be a competitive team. Now, will it be as competitive as the last year trip to the Sweet 16? No, it won't be. It won't be. I think that's safe to say. But getting them into the tournament, that would be a good thing, I think, for right. them this year. That would be a major step for Wes Miller because they haven't been there in the last couple of years. Not since he's taken over as head coach for Mick Cronin. So, you know, look, they, they, they clearly uh, have some issues. They've shown at times – that they can be highly competitive. And then they've shown at times, like last night, and Miller said after the game, he said, you know, he said, I, he didn't use the word, and I want to make sure you hear me now. He did not use the word quit. He never used that word. But he used every word in place of the word quit. He said our will and our passion and our drive and our confidence just completely shut down. Said we got dominated up front, 45 points in the paint. Delaware shot 56% from the field in the second half. Xavier turned the ball over 17 times. They blew, what, a 9 or a 10-point lead in that game? Something like that? Yes, I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, look, he was really upset last night. Uh, and, and I always at least admire when, when coaches come on and just say, you know what, th- th- this is just brutal. I don't know what else to say. I, the turnovers last night were brutal. So I watched the game um, because I support local Cincinnati sports, and I even bet on Xavier. 
So that just sh shows how much of a fan I am. Uh, I was watching the game. Tom, do you know how many points they scored off turnovers? The Delaware Blue Hens. Yes, they scored 30. 30 points off turnovers. Yes. They were just kicking the ball around. I don't know what the hell was going on with Xavier yesterday. It was a bad game. I guess you can chalk it up to a bad game, bad, bad week and a half or so. I don't know. But it's not good. I think Trace is right to a degree. I don't. I, I, at some point, a team's just not very good. And, and could Sean Miller win a couple games here in conference play? Yeah. It, just like the Delaware Blue Hens and the Oakland Grizzlies can beat Xavier on their home court, Xavier can certainly upset some of these Big East teams. So the season by no means is over. But it, it's unlikely that it's, it's unlikely that this team can put together a uh, tournament tournament caliber season i do believe however that uh that that they can win this game this weekend oh they 100 percent. oh wait a minute i want to make it very clear and, and again oh they're I, terrible what are you talking no, about i'm not going down that road you want me I, to do it i'll do it for you xavier will not beat uc okay yeah, i mean right. that's that's, what, it we've that's what we've seen that's what we've seen so let it be done you watch the watch the play on the court they they have they, they have no shot do they trace i'll Would tell you? you again you want me to do it i'll do it you, you sit here and you you want to like it's just like the TCU thing. It's the same. It's the same concept. You get this notion of all oh, this you nostalgia. See very this similar nostalgia, to Georgia blah, football. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that all you very all similar. you can reconcile about saying one team could have have a chance of beating another team is a bunch of basically uh, things that are unqu unquantifiable. Which is oh the mystique of Centos. Well, it was a real mystique against Centos against Delaware yep. and Oakland. <laughs> I mean, uh, hell, you. nobody walks into the Centaurs and walks out with a win there. Well, mm -hmm. Delaware just did it, and Oakland just did it in the past week. So yeah. if UC loses this game, I'll say it right now, I'll shut up forever about the whole Xavier thing. Maybe they have a, a, a beautiful mystique over there with this rivalry. I'm not saying they're going to get pounded because maybe they'll have some pride, but they're not going to beat UC. Okay. UC's look good. Tell you who else has looked good. Uh, you know, we were talking about the Big East. Uh, I'm not sold as, as many other people are in the Big East this year. I think you're really top-heavy. Uh, UConn looks unbelievable. I mean, they lose three starters. They lose the four top scorers from a national championship run a season ago. And, man, Hurley has got it going on again. If you watch them against North Carolina that second half last night, they are really good. Um, Marquette. I, I got to tell you, I, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, they played Wisconsin, who's yeah. got a good team. They're Rivalry ranked 23rd. Game. Wisconsin took it to them, man. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Creighton is ranked 10th. They got annihilated uh, by somebody who's ranked behind them the other night. Who am I forgetting who it was? Just, just completely killed them. Nebraska. Yeah, and I mean, I'm Oh, no, 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 my bad. They just lost yeah. to Colorado State Colorado last week. Colorado State by 26, I think, something like that. They, they lost by 21. 21, okay. And, and I'm just sitting there kind of saying, okay, but then I look at, if you look at some scores, you know, just scrolling through last night, you look at the providences of the world who have had some good teams. Ed Cooley there. Now all of a sudden he's at Georgetown. You know, you look at Georgetown. You look at Seton Hall. You know, these teams are getting beat regularly. So I don't know how good... The big DePaul and some, I mean, come on, come on. So, uh, what you were going to say? Well, I was just going to say that they I threw it all as I'm trying to get this camera over to me. Um, there we go. Um, you know, they still got three teams ranked in the top 10. I know that was your point that they've got top heavy, but there's also like Providence is, is going to be a good team. I mean, Patino's over there for St. John's. I don't know how good they're going to be in year one. Um, Butler has a, has a much better team than they've they had in, in years past. They do. So, I mean, it, the Big East is still one of the top premier um, conferences in college basketball. There's no doubt about that. And if we're talking about where Xavier's going to sit in it, it's not going to be great, right? It's not going to be very good. I, I knew everything I knew that I needed to know about Xavier at Big East Media Day when I knew no one was coming back. Zach Fremantle was supposed to come back hurt. Jerome Hunter was supposed to come back hurt. So right. Des Claude was the only guy that was going to come back. And Sean Miller pretty bluntly said, at Media Days, he said, listen, the team we're going to be at the end of the year is not the team we're going to be at the beginning of the year, which saying to me, oh, we're not very good right now. Hopefully we're a lot better come, come February, March. Hopefully they can make a run in the Big East tournament. And, and you, you mentioned it. If they can somehow scrap around to, to be near the bubble, to, to be at least considered on Selection Sunday, then, yeah, that would be a great year for, for Xavier. 
Miami plays tonight at Ohio State. Ohio State has really flown under the radar. They're 7-1. and one. They've had some good wins this season. They're ranked for the first time all year long. They play the Fighting Red Hawks. That's right. 23-and-a-half point spread last I checked on Bet Fred Sports. Will you be putting any money on the Red Hawks v. Buckeyes in Columbus tonight? I wasn't going to, but because you asked it, and I know how bad of a coach Travis Steele is, and I say that oh with no, no respect whatsoever, uh, I will take the Ohio State Buckeyes minus 23 and a half. I will do it for you, Tom. I will cheer for your Buckeyes, and maybe they can play some meaningful basketball uh, at the end of their season because, unfortunately, this Ohio State football team couldn't play meaningful football towards the end of theirs. So. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just I'm just cheering for Ohio State. Really, is what I'm going to do. You are. Yeah. I thought you rooted for the the high nooners. The high nooners. No, I do not root for the high. Which, nooners. Which, by the way, speaking, speaking of, of high nooners. Yeah, yeah. I knew you guys <laughs> found them yesterday. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we went through the whole show yesterday. I guilty as charged forgot them on uh, Tuesday morning, or I mean on Monday morning, because Miami of Ohio won the MAC championship. So I walk out the door yesterday at my house about six thirty. And, and I'm driving up here, and I stopped to get gas at UDF, and I said, uh, I said, oh, God, I forgot him again. And I'm like, and I mean, you know, there's just like dozens of these things sitting around in our garage. Uh, one day when your kids are a little older, you'll understand all that. Uh, and they're sitting around in our garage, and, um, and, and, and I left without them. So I'm standing there pumping the gas. It's about 32 degrees. It's raining. And I'm standing right down the road down here. Right down the road. Right where you get off. I think it's a Fairfield Middletown exit there, right by the big water tower where there's yep. a UDF right there. I go yep. there every morning. Prince so, you know, I know everybody works in there in the whole nine yards. And I see these same guys every day, these two young women and this one dude who's the manager. And I come walking in, and he always says, hey, boss, how you doing? Hey, man, how you doing? Blah, 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 blah. So I talk to the ladies. They're very, very nice. How are your kids? I'd have a good Thanksgiving. And, um, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, there is no way I can show up for a second straight day and not have those high noons. So I had the coffee sitting up there. I had one of those sweet ham egg, uh, sausage, egg, and sausage, egg, and cheese biscuits they have there. And then I took a, a, a U-turn and walked straight back to the cooler. Look at that. Ooh, the tropical pack. I bought, yep, because I never know what you guys might like around here. So this has, the tropical pack has, for your drinking pleasure, gentlemen. Yep. It has what we got? two watermelons, two mangoes, mm. two passion fruits. What could be better than a high noon in Oxford, Ohio, a passion fruit before a big one in Jaeger Stadium? And two pineapple flavors. Ooh. So, boys, vodka and soda, watermelon, mango, passion fruit, and, uh, pi and pineapple. No sugar added. 100 calories. Of course, when you're talking about Miami of Ohio, it has to be gluten-free. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Right? That's how they win so many MAC championships <laughs> is they, they, they stay off the gluten. Ohio would know nothing about that. So we've got them here, boys. We've got them right here. They want you to drink one. Well, um, Trace, is the, Trace chugs them, too, on, on the warm, Red Show. They're warm now. So I will drink one on Friday. We'll put them over here in the fridge um, at Headlines in their fridge. I bought them yesterday, and they sat here all day yesterday because I completely forgot. When did you guys notice they were here? Like 3 o'clock. I'm surprised none of them are open. At the, well, we wanted to save, save the surprise. When did you sneak them in? Trace saw you do I'm it. I'm the first one here every day. I'm Are not you, patting no. myself on the back. I'm okay. just an early riser. So, I, I, I mean, I didn't have to cover them up, hide them, nothing. I mean, I walked in with my shirt. I walked in with my backpack. And I walked in with an eight-pack of high noons. See, it's I thought you brought them in. It's a good look in downtown Hamilton to be walking around yeah. at 7.30A. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the expectation. That's right. You need some... You need some uh, Brown paper bags. Need some yeah, brown paper bags right. around, right. around I, town. I decided Hamilton. hell with that. They don't care in Hamilton. That's no, right. That's they right. don't care. Dora. There's, there's Dora. Dora. There's Dora. There's Dora yeah. down here. 
Sure. So there is. There yeah. is. For real. For we, real. We had it before Cincinnati had it. They are copiers of the city of sculptures. So are you Things saying are like at 730 in the morning you can walk around with an open container? As long as, long as, as you, you get it from the, one of the, the yeah. bars around here. Yeah. That'd be oh, your so problem. you got to have like a cup. Got to yes. have a cup. Now, you know, during big events, though, those, that, that doesn't really that get. Out uh, the yeah. Oh, and there's no doubt. Yeah. No I thought doubt. you brought it in when you left the, the, the studio and you came back for the break. Because I had seen you grab something over there, and I thought you were fumbling around with the, some of the. I was opening it so I that's, could flip everybody one during that's the show. How, that's how I knew that you had them. And then I think that we got uh, we got on the Jake Browning, or we were talking about the Bengals, and you just got sidetracked. And next thing you know, we forgot. Hmm. But it happens. Oh well. What, 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 uh, a sixty-year-old with a backpack. PB wants to know. Yes, yes, it is. What's wrong with that? Well, there's not a damn thing wrong with that. Damn right. I can't think of any problem with that. Nick Mormon says, "Why not black cherry?" I, they weren't in the in, in the box. <laughs> Tom, what, 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 flavor what, what flavor would you go with there? What flavor would you go with? You look like a pineapple guy. I, you said passion fruit, right? Passion fruit. I mean, he's got to look at him. He's not sure what they are. Yeah, I, I mean, I got to think maybe uh, either yeah either pineapple or the uh, the watermelon. I think. Okay. Yeah. No mango. No, 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 no nothing I, against mangoes. What, what would be your choice? Uh, out of we'll the, all have one Friday. What, what, what are you going to have? Oh, passion fruit, one hundred percent. And you, Trace? I would go pineapple. We would. And what about pineapple? You? Really? Pine- well, we only have. I'm going to have to drink. Then I'll drink watermelon. Well, well, you well, well if you drink. want the pineapple, Tom. No, I, no, 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 no. Because believe me, it will be my first sip and my very last sip of a high noon. Okay. Tom, here, all right. Here's the question, Tom. You know, um, you, you get on a beach, you're on a little vacation. You said you're a beer drinker. You, you stick I am. to beer. I am. You stick to beer. You're telling me when you go on a little vacation, you're, on, you're at a tropical resort or something like that, you don't, you don't dip into the fruity drinks at all? No, I, I will. What's, what's your, I will for sure. What's I will your for tropical sure. drink my, of choice? My, my wife wants to have a, um, uh, what do you call them, a pina colada? A pina colada. Oh, yeah. you know, yeah, maybe delicious. one. Delicious. Maybe one. And then, and then you slide right into the, you know. The, the, the cold beer. The Miller High Lifes. Whatever. Anything. Really anything. Um, you know, my son, well, you know, he's not allowed to drink. Right. Never That's mind. right. That's right. No, but he's I'm not told allowed that to drink. Natty Light yeah. is really good. Natty Light's terrible. Are you what, a beer you don't, drinker? You don't drink beer. What are you talking about? I don't drink about? beer. I don't drink well, beer. Well, then how are you but wait able to make any but wait kind a minute. of Natty difference? Light's I've had, fine. I've, I've had sips here and there, and Natty Light's disgusting. You can't. I, I guarantee you cannot tell the difference between a Natty Light and a Bud Light. Oh, I know I could. That's why they're all gross. I'll drink my high noons, and I have no shame about it. Here's the thing. No Look, shame. Here's the thing. You, you, can, you can make fun of Xavier and be in this highfalutin crowd or anything like that. You go up in the top section of the Centos Center. They have a little area where they sell beer. It's called the Norwood Cafe in the Centos Center, which is after. In the upper deck? Yeah, in the upper deck. It doesn't matter where we're sitting, where our tickets are. My dad, Mark Mouse, makes, hey, let's go up to the Norwood Cafe. Let's go up there. Nice. You know why? Because they got $4 Natty Light drafts. So we just sit there. We don't, I mean, you might think Xavier's a Stella Artois. I am not going crap. to allow to use the one out of a million examples. Stella Your dad Artois. and Xavier fans do not go hand in hand. <laughs> that about? is like That I'm is Catholic. like the oasis in the middle of a desert. <laughs> that is not the usual. Well, yeah, it's I mean, normally just, that high brow crowd. Nah, let me tell you something. His dad and Xavier fans in general, they will not get along. <laughs> Why? Well, because one guy's really hard nose. Stick your nose in the grindstone. Like you Sean, work, you like be- Sean, you Miller. Work your- Sean Miller, that Chris Mack. Guy. Maybe so, but just saying. I'm listen now, Matt Mouse, Matt Mouse, my brother. He's he he doesn't partake in the natty lights. He fits into more of the the stereotypical uh, Xavier crowd. He, he wears a vest around. He's and- the guys that are trying to beat traffic with three minute three <laughs> minutes left him. in the game. That's him. That's I him. mean, a cold natty light for four bucks sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Tom, I'll see you there on Saturday. Uh, you know, while I was looking, we were talking about this before the show, t- tickets, right? I'm just thinking, I, and we were kind of talking in here, and I, and I said, you know, I, it'd be fun to go down there. I used to go, I used to announce that game every year uh, for years and years and years and years. And it would really be fun to go down there. And I said to Reed, I said, well, you, you know, how much do you think a ducat is down there? He says, buck 50. And he mm-hmm. wasn't far off. I mean, upper tank, upper tank, way upper tank. Right. Like in the corner, right? Uh, is a hundred bucks just to get in the door, uh, in the the two hundred level, which it is the second level, uh, as it is in many buildings in the Centos Center, no different. Uh, you, you know, for a decent second deck seat, you're jumping up to two hundo plus second deck. Yeah. I was debating going, Tom. I'm I'm de- I'm still debating it. 
getting a ticket or are you getting I, i'm debating going some strings uh I, I will not pull strings my poor friend uh my everybody knows him his name is zach his dad gets tickets to cintas through his company a lot and he had an option to go to this game but he says he couldn't take the misery of losing so he chose a different one uh that's that's where uc fans are right now i'm debating going because this seems like the one chance since like 2004 that we have a chance to win this 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 basketball game so if it costs 150 dollars to get in and i will credit Cint- the, the cintas center it is, a, it is a good place to watch yes, a basketball game. There's That's really good. not a bad seat. Right. I've been up in the upper tank. Yeah, uh, and really, you can sit all the way back up against the wall, right. and it's a, it's a damn good seat. So I am still debating going. The issue, Tom, if I spend $150 on the game and we lose, oh boy, I won't, I won't, I, I, what can I do then? I mean, that's first of all, Sean said it in our chat yesterday. That's like a quadrant three loss if we lose this. I mean, it's just, it's just not a quality game, uh, and that's unfortunate. Xavier doesn't really uh, show out against these bad teams, but it, the, 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 the scale of this win has dropped dramatically. So if we lose this game to an inferior opponent, it's just a bad resume look for the Bearcats, and it's a, it's a terrible morale beat. Terrible morale beat. Tom, would you uh, – we'll go around there. Would you think most UC fans would rather beat Kansas on the road, who may be the ranked one or two, whatever they are, or win in Centos. Oh, I, there's no doubt. Centos. No doubt. Kansas is Kansas. And if you beat them during the regular season, it would be unbelievable. But you're not there to celebrate it and kind of bragging rights because you're not hanging out probably with a lot of Jayhawks fans unless you're spending time at the Fowler House. Uh, Elliot, what would you choose? What would I choose between what again? If, if you could say right now you're guaranteed to win against Kansas and or Xavier – you play Kansas one time, I believe it's in Kansas, and then Lawrence. Um, you, you're obviously playing Xavier on the road as well. If you're guaranteed one win, which one would you take? Xavier. Yeah. I, I think that'd be 90-plus percent. I would, I, I would want Xavier. Because it's been so long, mm-hmm. especially beating him there. Yeah. And, it's, and, 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 again, I would love to beat Kansas, but realistically I don't expect the University of Cincinnati to beat uh, Kansas and Fog Allen Fieldhouse. I just don't. I don't think that. Well, that's happen. not the question. That, that's part of the question. I, like you get a guarantee. More, you get a guarantee. No, I know the question. I, I'm aware of what the question yeah, is. Yeah, like a, from a tournament resume standpoint, right? You, it you, obviously you, would you, be better to, to beat Kansas. Yeah, no doubt. You're gonna you're gonna get the benefit of the doubt of, of saying, hey, you might be on the bubble, but you did beat Kansas and Lawrence versus. Yeah, but we haven't oh, beat, we beat, we beat. We haven't beaten Xavier in so long. I just want to win. Yeah, I don't. Care. Well, I was just asking that question because there was a debate last year right. of of. Uh, of there was a debate that, that someone said they would rather beat UConn than UC. That, that, did, that, that was a thing. That's a terrible take, and I wasn't going to bring this up until you just said that. There was somebody who worked here, Tom. I don't, I don't remember his name. He worked here, and he quit. He's the biggest Xavier fan I've ever met. And since leaving this job, Xavier's really struggled. And I think you could argue that there's starting to be a curse, right? Is it the – BLP curse? Is that what we're going to call it? Everett was bringing it up in the chat. Oh, boy. 1831 curse? Eight, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, listen, I don't know. Oh I'm not going to sit here and say there is for sure, but you got to wonder where they lose to Oakland at home, Delaware, the Blue Hens. Both tough tough games. At home. And Both not tough only, games. you know, now I'm escaping who you're talking about here. I, I'm drawing a blank. Yes, yeah, so am on, I. The, I you know, it's hard to remember. We've had a lot of people kind of in and out the door here, but especially over the last year or so. <laughs> but, um, and probably a few more should be shown the door. <laughs> but, but having said that, <laughs> me included, uh, having said that, um, you know, I think to myself, not only if I'm thinking about the same dude, not only has this happened, I think this guy is on the payroll at Xavier. Really? I'm really? quite sure that his paycheck comes from Xavier University. Am I wrong on that or right? I don't know if it all comes from there, Tom. But I, you, I, don't, I, don't I don't think it's speculative. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't think so. They did hit a half-court shot, though, last night. Did you see that, that Tom? That was cool. The fan hit the half-court yes. shot. What did he win? Uh, I, if it's, it's Xavier, it's probably free car uh, wash or something. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a couple, a couple vests, like just a couple. They get, they get the to go to s- all the Xavier team shop. Around there. Yeah, it's well, a trip to the team shop. Big yeah, league. they get to go to Sunday mass. Gotcha. Mm. They get to have their donation. All right, Tom, this is where you got to get us back on track. 
Well, he was a guy today, and I'm not Catholic, but I mean, I'm, I, I think I have it figured out that Jesuits are Catholics, right? Yes. And, and, and Dominicans are uh, Ca- Catholic. I mean, Dominican Republic. Citizens. No, yeah. I mean, and uh, Franciscans. Catholics. Uh, all sex. The long robes. All the, sex you know, of ca- yeah, Catholicism. Yeah, they're all, that's right. And, and Elliot, who was groomed at uh, Elder High School, one of the great Catholic high schools in our entire region. Wouldn't be the first groomed at Elder High School, but yes, go on. Yikes. He made the comment that he wasn't sure that, 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 that Jesuits were Catholics. <laughs> Correct. And you immediately jumped in and said, are, are you kidding? He, yeah, so we were talking about this before the show, and Tom asked the question. He's like, Elliot, you, you're Catholic. You went to a Catholic school. How are you not a Xavier fan? And Elliot goes, Xavier's a Jesuit school. And we're like, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's Catholicism, right? Like, that's still a part of it. Yeah. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure that Elliot knew that. I'm not I sure that Elliot I just think this story's it. a little bit out of context. It's not out of context. I'll, I'll That's tell you what, you said exactly what happened. But I'll tell you what, I'll play your guys' little game. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll play your guys' little game. Sure, I didn't know what it was. I, I'm a silly little boy. I'm a silly little, I'm a silly little fellow. So we'll, we'll give you a chance to defend it. Did you know? I did know. That Jesuit was, was a sect of Catholicism. Yeah, he did know that. I was aware. He did. Mm, he did. Mm, not sure. He did. Not sure. All right, we got 15 minutes left here in the program. Are there any things I'm missing that we're doing today? Uh, we're going. So we have the free box lunch. Um, we do not. Sorry, get this camera on me. I'm still learning. Still learning these keys. You're, you're, um, you, you've had a good day today. Um, we will not have Reed's top five because I have to do this. We'll do that tomorrow as long as Casey's back. Um, and we do not have the stink list today. Okay. Could you, Tom? Could you go over the monologue real quick? And I just want—I I just want. Is there to, something you want to ask about in it? Well, no. I just want this part read. If you could read that part real quick, <laughs> and then just read it. So we're just—we're just, just going to read this part. This is—this is ridiculous. We're just going to read this part. I will not stand for this. What is going on at Xavier? <laughs> Head coach Sean Miller let his team have it after last night's. Stunning loss to Delaware, 87-80. The Muskies' third straight home loss. Two against teams that were double-digit underdogs. Hate this. Remember Oakland? Where is Oakland? The Muskies (laughs) turned it over 17 times. Allowed Delaware to shoot 56% from the field in the second half and were dominated up front. Miller said his team lacks passion and the will to win. Next up, Crosstown Shootout against the unbeaten 7-0 UC Bearcats. It, does that cover it? Yeah, that gets it. That, get, that gets it. Listen, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not. Listen, we, we, we do this show. I, I, we can't be a this Cincinnati so sports show. And, I mean, can you imagine being like an FCC or in a Xavier fan and, and just hear all, of the, all the bad things that are said on this show about those two programs, that, that, that franchise and that program? I, I have never said a bad thing about any Cincinnati sports team. So I will not stand here yeah. on this show, oh, produce this show, Lord. and let, let's do our little ha-has and our little giggles about the Xavier Musketeers because they lost to a Blue Blood in the Blue Hens. Well, you and your guy are on the same page on this one. Your guy, Mouse Cop, he is taking tremendous, tremendously hard this Xavier talk today. And no one in here is bashing them. No. Except we're, for maybe Trace. We're yeah, doing, we're doing, I, we're doing I I giggles and ha-has, bashing. and we're getting all our bad. little jokes clear, in. Listen, bashing. get all your jokes in. It's funny, right? Xavier lost to Delaware. See, this is why I'm not doing it, because I think X can win the game. It's, it's Xavier lost okay, but- to Delaware and the Oakland Grizzlies. Where's, where's Oakland at? California, but I'm still wondering. Somebody in the chat said coming this. this Saturday. There's a big game at the <laughs> Centos Center, and heaven forbid the Muskies go in there and be and be favored on Betfred Sportsbook. This is the Xavier Super Bowl. This is Xavier Super Bowl. That happens in the Sweet Sixteen. You know, yeah. I give it up to UC. They're going to play. I give it. We've given it up Play-wise. to Xavier for playing Purdue and playing. Uh, Houston and all that kind of thing. Right. Uh, I, I give it up to UC. They have the, the, the game every year uh, against uh, Xavier, Crosstown Shootout. But they're also playing Dayton this year. Dayton, by the way, plays tonight at home at UD Arena, best basketball arena in the country, uh, against UNLV tonight. Um, Dayton off to a nice start. But the Bearcats and the Flyers will resume that robbery coming up here soon. Now, a couple people in the, in the chat 
uh, one thing I did have in the monologue today, among many, many other things, um, the Major League Draft Lottery last night. I know we're totally doing a 180 here. I get it. But we're wrapping up the show here in a few minutes, and I was just curious what everybody thought about this. I, I can't decide if I like this. The NBA w- was the first one to start it, and the reason you do it is to avoid teams from quote-unquote tanking so they have the worst record in all the baseball guarantees them the first spot, right, in the draft pick. Same thing with the second worst record. You get the second pick in the draft. Well, now what they do is, and we've seen it with the NBA lottery, they do it with baseball. Now, if I'm not mistaken, they had uh, Brad Paisley last night that was up there saying the results of the lottery. That's pretty big league. Mm-hmm. Sure. Pretty big league. He's a big leaguer. Um, so, you know, basically in a nutshell, if you have, you know, say, say 11 teams it is in baseball, I believe, that have the 11 the worst records in the league, okay, they all go into this machine where there are a bunch of balls. Well, it's statistically loaded up. The team with the worst record has the most balls inside of this machine. So the likelihood of their team being chosen is much higher than a team that would be 10th or 11th on that list. That's the, the, the nuts and bolts. Well, last night, you had the Reds, who were better than 500 last year, two games from reaching the playoffs, uh, got the second pick in the draft, which I don't know what the odds were on that on Bet Fred, but, I mean, it, it was pretty high. Even longer on the odds, the Cleveland Indians – had a 2% chance of getting the number one pick. And guess who got the number one pick? The Cleveland Indians. The Buckeye State hit the lottery last night. Your that's, thoughts, if any, on that? That's pretty wild. I'm not a big fan of the lottery thing. I think that's kind of a gimmick, and I don't. I, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, if I'm going to be honest. I, if, if you're the worst team, you should get the number one pick. Yes, I agree. I, 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 this I, I, Is there a reason behind that? I just said because you, you don't want teams to tank for the – for the one seed. That just seems silly to me. All right, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's improbable. I, Devin Mezzarocco on Twitter yesterday called it. Shout out to him. Uh, two, uh, having a 2% chance to get the number one pick and getting it's pretty wild, and that's what the Guardians got. Reds, again, same thing. It's big It's big for the farm. And what it allows us to do, perhaps, is, is now, and, and again, maybe they won't do it, but perhaps they're able to now trade a prospect for a starter that you're asking for, because now we know we can replenish the farm with this number two draft pick. All right, but do you know how many times? Your yeah. question for the room, and I know some of you already know the answer to this. And by the way, uh, did I say Indians? I'm sorry. Guardians. Guardians. Yep. Um, the Guardians and the Reds, according to Nick Mormon in the chat, getting picks one and two were 50,000. Was it 50,000 or 5,000? 5, 5, to one odds. Forgive me. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, where was I going? Uh, okay. Question, have the Reds ever had the number one pick overall in the draft since the draft, Major League Baseball draft started in 1965? Have they ever had the number one pick, yay or nay? Bounce around the room. I don't believe they have. They've had the number two pick a couple of times in recent memory because Hunter, Hunter Green and uh, Nick Senzel were both second overall picks, but I don't believe they've ever had the number, number one. Number one or no? No. Number no. one or no? No, they have not, and that's the answer. They've had three times they've been the number two pick Kurt Stillwell who many of you that watch his show will not remember him him and he was a shortstop kid out of California phenomenal player uh, uh prospect let's put it that way ended up having a good career just wasn't much of a hitter and one of the greatest decisions ever made in the history of the Cincinnati Reds franchise Kurt Stillwell and Barry Larkin were one draft separated from one another both number one picks um and the Reds had to make a decision which one were they going to keep and which one were they going to trade once they both got to double AA, A, triple A? Who's the long term answer? And both were having really good minor league careers. Stillwell, Larkin. They traded Stillwell, kept Larkin. And then the other two, number two overall, you just mentioned it Nick Senzel out of Tennessee, Hunter Green um, out of uh, high school in California. Um, what was that, five, six years ago now? Let's see how well you know your Reds history. Who was, who was Kurt Stillwell traded for? Who did the Reds get in, get in return? I want to say they traded him to Kansas City. Correct. Um, One name has had some success here with the Reds. Cowley Day. I was around for that. Um, who was it? 
Danny Jackson. Yeah, oh, the success. Guy right. was 23 and 8. Should have won the Cy Young in 1988. And 23 and 8. You should have seen that cat that year. That was the best season a red starting pitcher has had in the last, I don't know how long. It might go down as the single greatest year a starting pitcher for a Cincinnati Reds team has ever had in 1988. Danny Lynn Jackson, 23-8, and eight, ERA in the twos, led the league in innings pitched, led the league in complete games, led the league in shutouts, but did not win the Cy Young Award. Any idea why? Uh, 1988, uh, Oral Hershiser set the record for consecutive. You're the man, Reed. You're cons- the man. Consecutive You're the uh, man. innings pitch without a, giving up a run. You're impressive. the man. That's pretty impressive. And the Dodgers won the World Series. Yep, they won the, pin, yes, won the World that's, Series. Yes, that's the reason why he did not win the Cy Young. Match. You were getting ready to say something else, though. Oh, the other guy they traded for, they ended up never playing for the Reds, was uh, Angel Salazar, who there we go. was a shortstop for like the Expos and stuff like that. But your years. point about, okay, now does this mean you can do it, okay? You know, is this going to be one of those? The kid, Trace, you mentioned that they drafted last year out of LSU. Pitcher, major league ready, allegedly. Or you said it the other Rhett day. Louder. Yep. Yeah, right. Okay. So, you know, sometimes, you know, most teams like going the college route a little bit more. Some go the high school route. If you're going to go the high school route, then that would immediately have nothing to do with you being able to trade away a guy now because it's going to take him a little while to get here. Yep. Unless you're drafting Ken Griffey Jr. And Ken Griffey Jr. ain't waiting until the second pick. Uh, even Hunter Green, had he not gotten hurt, it would have been a number of years before he got to the big league. He's the number two pick overall. Um, but if they go with a college guy, you might be on to something there. There's a chance. <laughs> Nothing's guaranteed. Like that's the yeah. thing about the yeah. MLB draft. It's tough. It's right? getting better. It's, it, it, it's it better. definitely is getting it's, better. It's I better. made a take a while back that, that obviously a guy that we both know where it was on my the case great. about. Um, I had made the said that it was basically just kind of uh, you know crapshoot. Yeah, was the word you like, used for lack <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, the draft is just a crapshoot at this point, and it's it, it has gotten significantly better. Obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it be analytics, whether it be just the, 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 the ability to be able to get metrics on guys versus back in the day, that certainly wasn't the case. Drafting has gotten significantly better. Um, I look back at like the last 10 years, Tom, of the second overall pick in the draft, and it's about 50-50. It's about 50-50 on whether or not they, they get to the big leagues. And then from there, it's about 25% whether or not they're an actual impact player or not. The most notable two guys that came of the Brown second overall them, right? pick um, which I didn't go back. Maybe that would have been the, the year before I looked. But yep. long story short, uh, Bregman was the was the mm-hmm. uh, 2015, I believe, and then Bobby uh, Bobby Wood Jr. was the second overall pick mm-hmm. as well. But again, you always have the sprinkled in guys of, and, and I'm not trying to kill Nick Senzel, but and, and and you could make the case that Nick Senzel could have been a a, a legitimate big time superstar if he didn't get hurt. So who knows? I mean, I'm not trying to, but my point is. Bregman versus Nick Senzel, a little bit of a drop off. Just a bit. So it's just just it, a bit outside. I don't get excited. Am I? I don't want to say I'm a bad. Like, obviously, I'm well. I'm known for Chatterbox Reds, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't get excited about the draft. I don't either. There's nothing about it that really gets me going. Nope. There's nothing that makes me think, "Wow, oh man, they got the two pick versus the eighth pick." It's like I don't know. Sometimes you get lucky and you get the eighth pick, like. And even the NFL. I mean, the NFL draft sometimes. I mean, the, the Texans, you could argue if the Texans had the first overall pick, they would have taken Bryce Young instead of C.J. Stroud. Now, whether or not those two guys – but point is, is sometimes guys fall to you that end up being a miracle, right. and it just you just got lucky because you didn't get the chance to pick. So yeah, the, the I just re- don't get excited about it. The reason that the MLB draft, and they, they try to market it hard, they try to make it a bigger deal than it is because they see the success that the NFL draft has and the NBA draft has – but the reason that the MLB draft will, will never me- mean that much to casual fans is because you don't get to see the instant impact of the player. Like, you can draft a guy first overall, best prospect that the sport has seen in a decade. Well, he's not going to play for the team for about two years. Yep. So it's, there's just not that immediate gratification of, oh, you got Bryce Harper. You've already got an all-star outfielder that can plug in your lineup tomorrow. Well, whatever. and the other thing about it, you're, you're spot on. And the other part about it is, is you really don't see these guys play unless it's a college guy, you know, pitching in the college world series. Correct. I mean, you right. really got to be a baseball fan to watch college baseball in the regular season. I mean, you got to be pretty hardcore. So, you know, 
whereas the college guys, by and large, every single cat that's drafted in that first round, you know who he is, where he played college football, and you Correct. watch him play a lot of games. All right, we got a uh, – what, what do we say our uh, cherry got a on song. top is today? Oh, now set it up for us, please. Yeah, so this is one of the best Christmas songs in the history of Christmas songs. And you really mean this. I really this mean it. This isn't some bit. No, it's no bit. I don't have bits, Tom. I'm, you do. I'm a very serious person. Uh, this is called Dominic the Italian Christmas Donkey. I never heard it. So now we were injecting Italian. He's an Italian Christmas donkey. That's his shtick. All right. Let's this is it. not going to get us in any. I've been in trouble already. I don't I, need a this repeat. This will not perform. get you in trouble. Everybody sing it. Everybody sings this song. I can't wait to hear this. Brought to you by Udia. The dulcet tones of Lou Monte. Hey, Jingity Jing. Bueller. It's Dominic Bueller. the Donkey. Jingity Jing. The Italian Christmas Donkey. La la la. La 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 la. La la la. La 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 la. I like this. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. What are we doing? And I'm his trying. name is Listen. Dominic. The cutest little donkey, you never see him kick. When Santa visits his paisans with Dominic, he'll be. Because the reindeer cannot climb the hills of Italy. Hey, jingity jing, it's Dominic the donkey. Jingity jing, the Italian Christmas donkey. La 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 Doing the last verse? Jingle bells around his feet and presents on the sled. <laughs> hey, look at the Mayor's Derby on top of Dominic's head. A pair of shoes for Louie and the dress for Josephine. The label on the inside says they're made in Brooklyn. Hey, hey. Jingity Jing, <laughs> it's Dominic the Donkey. Jingity Jing, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Italian Christmas Donkey. La la la. That is a big league tune. <laughs> is there one more? Children sing. Oh, 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 oh. Children sing. <laughs> that oh. is a great song. It's a good one. See, that was a See, good song. See, the problem is, is some of you going to think that we have, uh, you know, we don't have any rhythm in here because we, we have found out when we sing the song for our letters that there is a, a slight pause between what we hear and then what you hear. That's right. So while we were sitting there, it's going to appear to you like we're off. Believe me, we ain't off. That is a great song. Thank you. That's Dominic the Italian Christmas Donkey. Man, I love that song. That's a good one. What do you guys think? Trace, cultured. Thoughts? We're cultured. That, uh, that is a cultured song. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that again. Hopefully... Uh... Hopefully, we won't have like the woke police coming after us. It's something. a oh my god! That Jason Kelsey just sang it for his little Christmas show that they all did. Well, that's he good. Did? Good to know yeah, that Jason, Jason Kelsey Jason, did it. We're in the clear then, for sure. Well, it was okayed by the Eagles. The whole Eagles team started singing Christmas songs. Most talented singer in oh that my family. God, some of these people. A lot of people oh are saying god. it. Oh my! God. <laughs> this is your cast of characters, Tom. No, it's really not my cast of characters, but they do make me laugh. I will say that. All right. Uh, we have Box Lunch coming up. Uh, Elliot will be the host. Trace and Reed will be here. We certainly uh, wish Casey a speedy recovery. Hope you feel better, buddy. Uh, hopefully you're back tomorrow. If you're not, get some rest. Get well. Uh, Alexandria, take care of the old boy. And, uh, boy. Dominic the Italian Donkey. That is a big league song. That will be played at the Brenneman House. You can mark it down later this afternoon. Love that. I'm going to learn every word of that song before Christmas. And You're we're a gonna sing it. We're going to sing it. All right, everybody have a great day. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Box Lunch coming up. Here we go.